Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the school board meeting on April 13th, 2010. Would you please rise and pledge allegiance? Okay, Alan, uh, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, the only addition that I have is just a very brief overview of the boiler situation and where we are at this point in time. So perhaps we could put that under communications as okay. H because there's no vote needed. Okay, very good. Okay, and I'd just like to remind the board members to um, put their microphones towards them and when you speak to lean forward not sit back because um, they do have a hard time picking up comments if we are speaking at this point. Okay. I know we got an email to that effect today but I'd just like to remind you again. Okay. Um, comments by student representatives. Middle school? Uh, we don't have any tonight. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, approval of school board minutes from Tuesday, March 9th, 2010. Do I have a motion? So moved. You move. <laughs> I actually need a motion, Linda. <laughs> move to approve the school board minutes from the regular meeting Tuesday, March 9th, 2010. Thank you. Is there a second? Yes. Second. Thank you, Mary. Any comments? All those in favor? David, are you in favor of moving the minutes? Thank you. Okay, now, comments by student representatives. Nobody from the middle school this evening. Okay. Um, from the high school? Um, at the high school lately, I don't believe we've had a meeting since our Winterfest week. Um, we had an exciting week of hall decorating and days to dress up, similar to the middle school spirit week, which was a lot of fun. It brings everyone together, and it was right in between the sports season, so everyone was available to be involved, um, which was a nice way to pick the spirits up in March. And now kids are, we just finished third quarter, uh, which was a little bit of stress, and, um, but people are kind of settling down before vacation and looking out to finish the year. Um, yeah, just to add, Spring sports are starting to get in the full gear. I believe games start this week. Um, long way vacation, Thursday, 2.20. Kids will be blitzing from school. And um, just in terms of the budget, I think I've been impressed by the involvement of the students this year. And I think everybody's excited to see uh, the stage kind of come to an end tonight. Any questions for um, Matt or Julia? Okay, thanks you guys. Okay, so we're going to move on to comments from public on agenda items. And what I would uh, ask if there's anybody who, here who would like to speak to any of the agenda items to please line up over here. And when you have a chance, when you're up to speak, please state your name and address um, and the subject matter that you're addressing. Is there anybody who'd like to speak? Okay. I just didn't have an agenda. I want to make sure it's on there. Maybe I can help you. What is the item that you're looking for? Are you talking about speaking towards things for the school budget tonight? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like to speak, could you come to the podium? My name's Erin Salvador. I live at 24 Wood Road. I have a large mortgage. No, I <laughs> didn't need to know that. Um, I'm here just to um, say thank you to the board and the administration for discussing the position of social work, keeping the social worker at Pond Cove during your last workshop meeting. Um, I think it was clear after your discussion seeing the importance of this position um, being retained, and I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the kids and families from Pond Cove. Thank you. Would like to speak on any of these things 
That's correct. And um, we do have a lot on the agenda, so I do ask people to keep their comments to about three minutes, if possible, please. Okay. Um, your I'd like name to and I'm sorry, your name and address, please. Uh, Jeff Preble, 9, Channel View Road. Thank you. I'd like to speak in support of retaining the advanced langu uh, accelerated language arts classes in the middle school and also uh, retaining the four teacher teams in seventh and eighth grades. I've got uh, four points that I'd like to make. Um, the first is that our language arts program is among the best in the uh, state. We have a very high fraction of our students that uh, exceed the, uh, the standards and a very low fraction that fall below. Uh, together, I think arguably you could say we have the best uh, language arts uh, program in the state. Uh, in other words, we're not being forced to make changes, dramatic changes in the language arts curriculum in the middle school because of low performance. But instead, our school has proposed these changes that I think have the potential to jeopardize our performance, not based on a requirement for change, but instead based primarily, I think, on philosophical uh, grounds of, of uh, a few important people in the school. The second point I'd like to make is that the information that as the school has presented so far on these two topics has been incomplete and in some cases misleading. Let me give you a couple examples. The school often cites uh, entrance in the freshman honors class in high school as proof that the ALA class is not effective. Uh, that is that there's a 50-50 split of the uh, students that go into ALA, uh, go into the uh, honors class um, between that are ALA, former ALA students and not ALA students. Well, given that the ALA class is maybe 30 or 40 people and the non-ALA students are somewhere maybe like 120 people, it's really uh, three or four times more likely that a student goes into freshman's uh, honors from an, as a former ALA student than a non-ALA student. Uh, we've also been told that ability-based grouping and tracking is a thing of the past, implying that our middle school is, keep, is keeping something that everyone else has abandoned long ago. In fact, maybe 50 to 70 percent of the top 10 schools in um, uh, Maine, middle schools in Maine, have ability-based grouping or tracking or separate classes of some kind or another. According to Loveless in the 2009 report, 43% of the middle schools in the nation track uh, language arts. Uh, that's an increase, by the way, of 40% since 1996. So the trend is toward increasing tracking in uh, language arts, not decreasing. Incidentally, 75% of the, uh, of the uh, middle schools in the nation track in math, as we do. So tracking and ability grouping isn't going away. It's become, it is a, an important part of the way middle schools operate. And for good reason. They, it, it works. We've also been told that research is clear showing that heterogeneous grouping elevates the performance of some students and leaves others unaffected. Um, this is a quote from the middle school. The intended change is not for the benefit of all. It is for the benefit of all and not to the detriment of any. Let me, and in fact, the results from the, uh, the research for heterogeneous versus ability grouping or tracking is not clear. Uh, let me read a couple quotes. In typical evaluation studies, uh, talented students from accelerated classes outperform non-accelerated students of the same age and the IQ and IQ by almost one full year on achievement tests. It's another quote from a different report. When students are ability grouped into separate classes and given an identical curriculum, there is no appreciable effect on achievement. However, when the curriculum is adjusted to correspond to ability level, it appears that student achievement is boosted, especially for high ability students receiving an accelerated <coughs> curriculum, which is what we're doing in, um, in the middle school. Um, I've got several others, maybe in the interest of... We have about one minute left. Okay. Uh, I think one of the most important ones is, um, this is a quote from uh, Loveless in a 2009 report. In the most widely cited of these meta-analyses, Kulik reports an effect size of near zero. Slavin reports an effect size of zero. 
In other words, no discernible effect. A, a school that switches from tracked to detract curriculum or vice versa should not experience any significant change in average test, average test scores. Kulik is on the tracking side, ability grouping side. Slavin is a, is a proponent of heterogeneously grouped. They're on opposite sides of that same argument. But the one thing they agree on is that average uh, scores on average will remain the same, that you don't get any benefits from uh, detracking. Um, two, two more points I'd like to make. First, it appears that neither the school board nor the public has participated in this proposal. We found out by chance uh, when it was mentioned casually during the conference. Many parents found out in a similar manner, and some only now are becoming aware of this change. It was acknowledged during the Thursday meeting that mistakes were made and they won't happen again. I think that's fine, but this is a big mistake regarding a dramatic change at the middle school and something needs to be done to correct the mistake and I haven't heard uh, anything about that yet. And the last is the objection to the two teacher teams for seventh and eighth grade. First, as a parent, uh, I'm worried that my child and children will get stuck with an incompatible group of kids or teacher team and they'll be stuck with them all day, every day for an entire year. They did that in kindergarten through sixth grade. They deserve a small degree of independence and opportunity, I think, to mold their school experience themselves when they're in uh, seventh and eighth grade. <coughs> Two more comments from uh, different parents. I'm sorry, time, it's time to wrap up, please. Okay. Um, on the same topic. Transition between classes, transitions between classes, an essential skill to navigate high school is difficult for many middle school kids. Having time in middle school to perfect the art of refocusing is an important skill uh, to master before high school, before you're forced to do it. One more from the same parent. Teachers who have been focusing on one subject only and teaching it very well will now be teaching a subject, a subject that they haven't been teaching for a while and may or may not represent a strength for them. I think it really amounts to this. Um, there are two kind of diametrically opposed options to choose from that the school board, I think, can choose. One is that we allow the school to adopt their proposals. We should recognize, though, they haven't provided a rationale for the change. They haven't presented objective data supporting the effect of the change. We haven't seen input from recognized experts on this topic. We haven't seen a written report. They haven't gathered positions from the public. And uh, there's been no debate within the community. And I don't think the school board has been, um, pro has provided input or uh, has the sc school taken guidance from the school board in this topic. The, one with the, the other diametrically opposed thing is to delay implementation to the 2011-2012 uh, school year. Require the school to pr produce a clear, thoughtful, objective argument, documented, documented in a written report that we can all read, it's available to the public, and then provide sufficient time for review, deliberation, and expert opinion. Sorry for taking so long. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak to uh, items on the agenda? Okay. Moving on to recognition. We have quite a bit. It's a rather impressive list here. Um, should we start with the um, High School Environmental Club? Would you like to speak to that? I don't see any students um, from the club or um, so I'll speak on, I've been a parent involved in the high school environmental club this year and the club has been going on about five years this year their focus their, their focus was on building a greenhouse for the district and in that work it came to composting how the kids could increase the composting well we the awareness of redu redu uh, recycling by reducing what we buy, recycling what we have, um, you know, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Uh, their compost trial, we did a compost trial. At, I know I need a, a, a theater. I think I need theater so I can speak uh, strongly. I'm looking at the theater group. Um, so they, 
They took the compost from the high school cafeteria every day. The environmental kids, about maybe 11, uh, 20 kids, but about five, six, seven to 11 kids on a daily basis went down to the cafeteria, encouraged the other kids to compost, and then um, dropped off the composting outside. We brought it and we hot composted it. So we took the meat, the dairy, and everything else and made a product out of it. This product took the, the weight of the trash out of the hopper, therefore reducing the hauling fees that went to the town to save money for the town. So that was the pick. And then they doubled it by going to the middle school and having the middle school do the same thing. And they also used the vegetable food to grow worms and rent worm farms and held, okay, so there's tons of things that they did. And they got an Eco Excellence Award from Eco Maine for their work. And they were the, the only students with how many people? Probably 50 people, mostly adults, administrators, town um, managers. And it was very, very impressive. And they stayed for four or five hours to the program, uh, talked, were much more eloquent than I am speaking, and did a very nice job and have brought it to the town, hoping that to increase this work um, in the future. OK, I shouldn't have talked that much. No, that's lovely. <laughs> it's nice to see somebody so Thanks. excited over trash. <laughs> trash? <laughs> Why do I speak first? Don't speak first. <laughs> Next is the uh, high school science team. Jeff? Actually, I have a few. Yes. Uh, um, if I can, so I can save shuffling papers if I can do them in the order that I've got them. Um, the first one is the um, Cape Elizabeth High School science team, uh, which competed in the state math meet two Fridays ago. I think it was two Fridays ago. Are you um, about the math team or the science team? The math. I'm, just, I'm doing the math team first. Okay. Um, and the math team came in second in Class B. Uh, which is a very good performance. Um, it's the highest they've had for a while, um, and it was a come from behind sort of second class second second uh, place performance. So very very impressive. Um, we have a number of students. Uh, Will Pierce uh, was 12th in the state among all seniors. Um, Ian DePaula was ninth in the state among all sophomores. Um, and we had the top scoring sophomore in the entire state who won a new Texas Instruments Inspire calculator, which I'm told is the envy of the rest of the team. And, that's, <laughs> and that student is Ethan Denino, who scored spectacularly. I'm not sure if he, I was looking to see if Ethan is here, but I don't think he is. Um, the team has been invited to attend the New England Math Meet. Uh, we're trying to figure out if we can do some transportation pooling from some, with some other states to save some expense, so we'll have to see. And Ethan has been invited to and will attend the um, individual national math meet at Penn State um, in June, which is a huge accomplishment. Um, okay, then I have, if I, if, again, if I can do my order, <laughs> uh, the jazz band. Um, this is sort of the last several weeks have been the culmination of uh, uh, months of rehearsal by the various Cape Elizabeth jazz bands um, and at the Berkeley Jazz Festival in Boston, um, which I had the pleasure to attend for about the eighth year in a row. It is an absolute pleasure for school board members. If any of you are interested in music and like jazz, it's a full day of jazz. You can go see not just our bands, but others as well. It's a great, great opportunity. Um, our High School Concert Jazz Ensemble came in uh, fifth place out of 15, 15, 15 bands at Berkeley, uh, which was a strong, strong performance. Um, I know that um, Adam Moyer uh, won two Judges Choices Awards uh, for both his work on the Jazz Ensemble, which is our large concert jazz band, um, and also his work on, uh, small, on the uh, combo that he's a part of. Um, and at the state jazz competition, which was um, nicely held in South Portland, just uh, I think it was last weekend, um, our bands took three gold medals, uh, the concert jazz band, the repertory jazz band, and the Thursday combo all took gold medals. Um, the Thursday combo won the state championship 
for their division. Um, and Ryan Ayers, uh, who plays outstanding alto sax, uh, was an outstanding musician in the multiple band division. And Cliff Bauman uh, was the same in the multiple combo division. So that's jazz band. Um, our science team, getting to that, um, our science team last, I think it, not this past weekend, but two weekends ago, um, took second place um, in the main science Olympiad. We came closer to unseating perennial champion Waterville than we ever have. Um, and um, uh, Dr. Garrett is aiming for first place next year. We'll see. Waterville is really tough and they've been doing it for years. Um, we took first place in three competitions, um, and Jay Cushing, Sam Nassif, Graham Finley, Ethan Danino again, and Ian DePaula um, were involved in the teams that took first place in their competitions. And then uh, the One Act Festival, again, I think it was two weekends ago. Some folks are here who can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was two weekends ago um, after our theater group uh, won first place at the regionals. Um, they went on to compete um, in Camden Rockport, right? Camden Rockport. Um, and they did very, very well in Camden Rockport. I think they came in fourth, um, uh, fourth overall, which was an outstanding uh, result. Um, the, Mr. Mullen pointed out that we received lots of awards. Um, so I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, we took top ensemble at both regionals and states, um, and we also won uh, for costume, mask, props, technical excellence, um, which I think is most of theater, so I'm not sure what anybody else beat us in, but um, they did a great job uh, with individuals receiving special commendation, including a number of who are coincidentally here tonight for a different reason, well, a related reason, Tom Campbell, A.J. Fristacci, Griffin Carpenter, Sasha Cohan, uh, Sam Barksdale, Luke Sisselman, Peter Campbell, Kelsey Krall, and Nolan Chase. And I think at the last month's school board meeting, I mentioned some folks who had won some writing recognition. There's one that's, that, that I learned of uh, from um, uh, Mr. Siegel, uh, I think since, so I don't think I mentioned this one, and that is we have one student um, um, there's a, there's this, a competition that's sponsored by the Portland Stage, Stage Company where students submit 10-minute um, original plays that they, that they have written. Um, and there are three winners statewide, and their, uh, their productions are actually put on by the Portland Stage Company. Um, and we had a student who, again, happens to be here, um, A.J. Fastacci. Um, who, you want to just stand up so they know who you are? That's AJ, um, uh, won one of the three winners. So his play, the mini play, The Non Catholic Confession, will be staged by the Portland Stage Company. I'm not sure exactly what date that is, AJ. Not sure either. To be determined. Uh, but some outstanding results uh, from lots of activities, and I hope I did that relatively efficiently. Thank, Thank you. you very much, John. Okay, I think that leaves us at the chess team. Okay, to start off with the chess team, I have some help here tonight. Uh, Dan Fishbein. Uh, Mark, are you speaking as well, or Dan will take care of it? Okay. Dan, thanks for coming in. Just want to recognize, um, uh, I'm a parent volunteer as well as proud parent. Uh, just want to recognize the different chess team accomplishments in, in some of the state and national tournaments the past several weeks. Uh, first of all, our middle school chess team won the state championship this year in fairly dominating fashion. Uh, that team has eight members, a couple of whom are here today. Uh, Matthew Fishbein, who I know well over there. Uh, Wesley Parker, who's in uh, the back row. Matthew Reali Hatem, Danny Brett, Nick Shedd, Ethan Duperry, Leo Wing, and Arden Wing, whose dad happens to be here. Uh, we also had the first high school chess team in Cape Elizabeth's history participating this year. They did very well in the tournament. They came in the middle of the pack with only freshmen and sophomores on their team. Brian Brett, Ethan DiNino, Anthony Frachero, Ben Hansel, Ian McInerney, and Brett Parker. Uh, our K-3 through team won a trophy for second place, Kyle Russell, Zara Friedman, and Rohan Friedman. And we had a K-6 through team, Olivia Reali-Hatem, who's here, and Jasper Hansel made up that team. 
Two weeks later in the individual state championships, uh, Colin Smith and Wes Parker tied for first place in the junior high uh, section. Jasper Hansel tied for second place in the elementary section. Uh, Ethan DeNino, whose name you've heard a couple of times already, tied for second in the high school uh, tournament. And Matthew Fishbein, who's a sixth grader at the middle school, won the high school championship. The youngest person in state history to do that, so I'm not sure whether that belongs to Jeff or, or to Steve. Would he happen to be here? <laughs> and he might happen to be here. Um, I also just wanted to, um, Matthew, if you could stand up and hold that up. We, um, our family and the Reality Hatems came back from Minneapolis last night where two of the eight members of our junior high team competed in the junior high school national championships and that is the 20th place team trophy in, in the junior high championships. Uh, perhaps more significant because it takes four people to make a team uh, and we only had two people. And uh, the scores of, of two people added up to be enough to uh, win a top 20 trophy in the country. And I can't get up to this podium without making a political remark, so I'll make a very brief remark. The other state championship teams, as well as Orono, who came in second to us, had full teams there, paid coaches, et cetera, et cetera. We had two of our eight people there, which the parents had to arrange on their own. So hint, hint for the future. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and Dan was telling me they needed to get a U-Haul to get the trophies back to school, but that's all right. <laughs> kind of sounds like some of these high school ones. Uh, we have, uh, I have a report for you also on a middle school student who, uh, in gymnastics competition, state level, um, Ethan Nesta Darling, who's a seventh grader at the middle school, has been participating in the gymnastics competitions for probably, that I'm aware of, at least the last five years. Um, he is, uh, I think, the f one of the first days I saw him in the school five years or, or around. Let's see, he would have been that would have been three years ago. He was walking on his hands down a hallway, and I had to stop and ask him why he was doing that, and then could he show that to me again? So, anyways, uh, Ethan uh, placed ex did extremely well, uh, third, second, or first place finishes in the pommel horse in the um, parallel bars, the rings, and the floor exercise, and um, his mother, uh, Annie, just emailed me to say that his, his results, the, the, com the combined total of his results means that he's the state championship uh, winner for his age level. So congratulations to Ethan. I don't think I saw him here tonight. And the next one that I wanted to do was Lily Jordan, who was going to roll in about 7.30. I'm looking and it says 7.30. So um, I'll start off a little bit about that. Lily, as you remember, was the Cumberland County B winner for uh, the Scripps National Competition. And then after that, she went to the state competition. And as you've probably seen in the local papers and on TV, she's the state winner as well. She'll be traveling to... Washington, D.C., I think it's June 20th, uh, to represent uh, our state. So we're proud of her accomplishments as well. Thank you. I'm sorry that uh, Lily's not here, but hopefully if she comes, we can have her stand up. Great. Okay, so moving on to communications. Alan, we have yes. a leave request. <clears throat> you do. Uh, the leave request that you have is from Carly Main. Uh, Carly has been a teacher at the middle school this past year, she did half-time teaching with Morgan and Burns. Uh, Carly had part of a year off in 2008 and 2009 because of the birth of her son. She is now expecting another child. And so what she is asking for is uh, to have next year off as she stays at home with her two children. This is a non-paid uh, release at that point in time. And I do believe that one you do have to vote on. The second one, which is a resignation, you will not have to vote okay. on. So we should add that as an yes. item of business. Yep. So if we could put that on as for 7D, that's the leave request mm -hmm. for Carly Main. And you do also have a resignation, and that is for Morgan Burns. She originally was at Pond Cove, uh, and then this past year has been, again, half-time at uh, the middle school. 
Uh, she writes to say that she is submitting her re resignation from my position as in instructional support teacher and Special Olympics coach, effective at the end of the 2009-10 school year. Although it was a difficult decision, uh, because she has enjoyed her time in Cape Elizabeth, uh, she feels it is particularly important that she give her time right now to her children. And so we do have her resignation, and so she will be leaving at the end of this academic year. This one you do not have to approve. It's only so that you are aware that she has resigned, which will therefore, between those two positions, will open up a position for uh, Dom to be filling at this point. Thank you. So, uh, next is student testing. Mm -hmm. uh, during the last um, month and a half, our student testing results have come through from the new testing that we're doing, the kneecaps, and we also have NWEA testing. Also, the state has put out a document, which I think I sent on to you before, that talks about the percentiles of how well we are doing uh, in this state, and we are right at the top of the scale. With that in mind, I have asked the three administrators, one from each building, for our, in the May meeting that they will do a brief uh, account of where their schools are testing at this point in time and what successes they are seeing. So in May, uh, each of the three principals will be presenting that information at that point in time. Thank you. Okay, next up is Middle School Accelerated English Language Arts Program. And I believe, Steve, you're going to be um, presenting some information to the board. to uh, show you tonight and these will be posted on the, they'll be attached uh, from a link to the school blog um, within the next week and there'll also be some supporting documentation that was handed out at a previous meeting so um, the uh, the point of our literacy work or one of the pieces that we've gotten to now is is this idea of collapsing upwards which is raising the standards for all students in our school here are some facts that I'd like to share with you that, uh, and this is the same presentation for the most part that was put out last Thursday, that 90% of all middle school students meet or exceed the standards on NWEAs, the former reading MEAs, and the current NECAPs. Not a bad statistic. I think most schools would say, thank you very much, we'll take that score. There are currently 72 students in the freshman honors English language arts classes 35 of those students were uh, accessed accelerated language arts last year as 8th graders and 37 were in uh, language arts classes. For next year we have currently recommended 73 students for the Honors Freshman ELA. 21 of those students are currently in the accelerated language arts while 52 are in the language arts classes. On the 2009 7th grade fall in WEA, there were 10 students who scored in the 99th percentile. Five of those students have participated in accelerated programming, language arts programming, and during the 6th grade year, and five have not, did not. And then also in the current 6th grade, seven out of the 13 students who scored in the 99th percentile on the fall NWEAs were not part of an ALA last year and have not been part, are not part of the ALA this year. Um, the uh, point that I'm making in this is not the idea that um, um, we're looking at saying that the ALA is not effective. The idea is to say how effective the language arts classes are. Uh, continuing that, I found these statistics from Cape Elizabeth High School to be interesting that at the top 10% for the last three years, you see that there are 14 students this year. 15 last year and 15 the year before. And out of that, um, eight students were in LA, six were in ALA. And then in the two previous years, it was eight and seven in both of those cases. So a uh, very, you know, 55, 45% ratio, showing that uh, both, programs, uh, both programs are equally viable. Each year, 92 to 96% of Cape Elizabeth High School students go on to college, and we know that the vast majority of those students 
are going to four-year colleges. Uh, this particular slide is not one that you hang out as a sign for the middle school to say, we're, this is, a, this is a, a, a celebratory piece. This is one that we said, we have data that tells us something that we need to pay attention to. And I think that's a great credit to the language arts folks uh, who teach at the school because it's not just about saying, show us all the good things and don't tell us what else is going on. Very fair-minded presentation and always looking to improve their practice. What you see here is that uh, the yellow it, on the MEAs, the last time the MEAs gave a writing assessment was in 2005. They did a calibration year in 2006, then they discontinued the test. Uh, the tests were invalid in 07, and then they discontinued it in 08, and the kneecaps were in 09. But guess what? Calibration year for them, for the, for the New England area. So we have been waiting for a few years now to have some common, uh, beyond our common assessments, to have something to refer to. What you can see is that the uh, purple bar shows that that's the range that if a student scores a 521 or above, they would be in the, in the partially meets the standard range. Um, if they score in the, from a 541 and above, it meets the standards. And then 561 and above would be exceeds the standards. What we notice in that data is that um, in 2002-03, our students in the middle school were barely above the meets the standard um, performance level on the writing portion in the eighth grade. And then in 2004, uh, it was a very slight decline. And in 2005, again, the same incremental slight decline. So that is something that we look at and say, you know what, the, the families in Cape Elizabeth do not send us students who should be in the partially proficient range as far as their writing performance goes. It's not about the students, it's about the practices that we were using at the time and the changes that we need to make. To make. And we believe we, we've gone a long way in making some of those. So uh, this is one of the compelling pieces. When we talk about either programming, the LA or the ALA, one of the things that people concentrate a great deal on is look at the, the reading scores. Well, reading's half, not even really half the picture. There are several other parts to language arts, and we see that we have uh, quite a bit of ground that we feel we need to make up on that. Um, where we look at the reading scores, and those are within like the five, fifty, six, seven, eight levels. So they are just slightly below the entire class, averaging exceeding the standards. Uh, we think, and we notice that our math scores are similar. So we think that the writing scores should be similar as well. It's the same group of kids, whether it's in math, reading, or writing. So it's, uh, it's about programming. And we've done, over the last three, uh, about three years, I think uh, most parents in the middle school would say they've seen quite a change in the writing program, uh, an emphasis and focus on that. A good deal in part, obviously due to the efforts on the staff, uh, particularly led by Jamie Michaud. So I'd like to thank her for her work on a continuing work on that as well. Um, when we talk about programming, whether it's an, a, an accelerated language arts or a regular language arts, one of the thing that I want, things that I think is very important to remind people of is that we are not looking at just a single statistic. What is your academic performance? That's a great statistic to have, but if it comes at the cost of a couple of other statistics, uh, that, that Cape Elizabeth would not care to lead the state in or lead New England in, then we need to, to look for a better balance. For instance, the emotional social development as well. In a reading that we did um, from a book by Dr. Levine, it was called The Price of Privilege, uh, there was, there was a, a, the clear information about the most important thing in middle school is the development of self and that self-identity and image and how important that is to, to students. If you're not sure if that's a great piece for kids at middle school level, like that's the number one thing, ask them where they're going. Say to, say to uh, like Matt could go home and say to his sister, uh, where are you and your friend going tonight? And the answer would likely be, uh, me and my friend are. And it's not because grammatically there's a misunderstanding of how to say that, it's because it's egocentric. Me, this is what I'm doing. And my friend's doing it as well. So we really focus on the whole student. And when we do that, we take a look at data that's, uh, that's available to us, like the MIDOS results. 
that talks about a uh, sharp increase in Cape Elizabeth. This is student reporting from freshman to sophomore years, uh, the increase in dealing with substances, alcohol abuse, and so forth. And, and that data is very telling to us and it's troubling. So um, we are concerned about the academic pressure to excel and what we find is direct correlation to factors such as uh, titling and, and pigeonholing students and placing them according to a perceived ability. Well, I want to remind you that that perceived ability, what I would prefer to think of as readiness points for the students in our school, is really what is the range when 90% of these students meet or exceed the standards on any state assessment or national assessment you can give them. How big a range are we talking about? In this idea of collapsing up, upwards, uh, we have had a, a real uh, push in state standards um, from the revision of the learning results for the parameters for essential instruction and quite possibly into the next round of things called Common Core. That's for a whole new meeting at some other point. The, so the standards-based education has been very beneficial to us because it allows us to use rubrics to uh, compare a student work to a particular standard and to allow the student to make adjustments to that as they move along so it's used as a formative piece rather than just a summative piece. And in this work we have uh, been heavily involved in curriculum development with priority and secondary learning goals. We've also done quite a bit of work on common practices, instructional techniques in the middle school, and then thanks uh, in large part to Jeff Shedd and Angela Shapani at the high school, working with the K-12 language arts folks, we also have some common tools that we're now using in, for instance, grammar instruction that goes from, I think it's 6 through 12, and then a vocabulary piece that I believe is 6 through 11. These are things that did not exist previously. And so the idea that we're creating here is that we are, we are going to equalize opportunities for all students. We're going to extend the uh, accelerated language arts opportunity to many other students in our school. And in order to do that, one of the keys to it is a teacher has to be able to differentiate the work that is going on in a classroom. It's not going to be, let's put all the students in the same room, give them all the same book on the same day, and give them the same worksheet to answer the questions on, and see whose who's, uh, insights were, were better. The nature, what we're talking about is the, the importance is the changing the nature of the work. It's not about the quantity of the work, and it's about allowing the students to have say in the work, for instance, whether it's open-ended written responses to uh, self-selected or, or small group controlled selections of uh, texts. It could be that a teacher assigns a certain genre or presents book talks on five different books and a student has an opportunity to choose within that. Big push in, in middle school literature is about the opportunity for children to choose some of their own destiny at the time that they're in school with us. And, and there's uh, really good results looking at um, what happens because of that. So our focus on differentiation uh, is something that's been happening for the last year or more. Um, I just uh, had a, uh, three other staff members with me at a Rick Warmly presentation on differentiation. He's one of the gurus of this um, idea. Uh, we just went to that on Friday and we will be doing quite a bit more work on that over the next few years too. It's, it's, not, we're, it's not a situation where we look at it and say, we're done, we're ready to go. Um, what are we ready to do? These are some of the ideas that we have in place or that we are currently working on. For instance, the Comprehension Toolkit is a really nice piece that um, provides common language and practices and tools for teachers to use in teaching comprehension strategies. It begins in our Pond Cove in the third and fourth grade, and now it will extend through our fifth and sixth grade. Um, so another common thread that binds across the transition years for kids, um, and it will provide for a common um, language. And you can see that there are a number of other things we're working on. The bottom one talks about professional learning communities. That's where we're building in time into the schedule for teachers to be able to work um, with content area peers as well as grade level peers to uh, continue their, their own professional development. And I would say that in the language arts area in, in the middle school has seen a, a huge increase in the teachers' capacities and their, their toolboxes to be able to provide differentiated instruction. Um, 
I mean, I'm sure everyone here knows John Casey. I consider this a Caseyism. When he says things, usually I just should start writing because he comes up with things and he says, now how did I just say that? Because I like that. So if you just take a minute and look at this quote from John. things that he mentions in here about to keep building on it, honing it, and increasing our toolbox options and resolve. I believe that that has uh, been in great evidence, and I think that it will continue to be in great evidence as we move forward in the next uh, coming years, few, few years. And then John mentions the courage that it takes to do that. I would like to just remind people that it would be a lot easier, a lot less stressful just to maintain the status quo. That's not our intention. Our intention is to figure out what should we be doing for every student in our school and take the, take the steps that require the courage to do that. Uh, oh, oops, excuse me. Okay, so um, how will we keep track of what's going on? The, the, uh, the, benefits, uh, the benefits, the strengths, the weaknesses and so forth and what we're trying to do and how will we continue to use that information to inform our practice. Well, we have many of the standardized pieces. That's always very helpful, the, the NWEAs and the kneecaps and the reading. We'll also use our common assessment writing scores. The next year's kneecap writing score will be a first time, so that'll be just a baseline piece, but we'll certainly use that as we move forward. And then uh, we'll also continue to collect feedback from Cape Elizabeth High School and the language arts program and the staff that, that they have there that, that gives us good information on what they see from our students. So that's it in a bit of a whirlwind nutshell. I'd like to know if there are any questions about uh, language arts. Um, Steve, can you just speak briefly or Jamie about how your teachers have prepared for differentiation and, and teaching in this way? Um, yep, yeah, I'll start off with that if you want to chime in, Jamie. I said to Jamie earlier, I said, I'll look at you and just say, take it away, Jamie. And she's like, yeah, take you away. Um, one of the things is in the six traits of writing, we have a, a common writing system that's used now in the entire school system. It's the right traits at the, at the elementary level and moves to the six traits in grades 5 through 12. So we have a common rubric. There are six sections that it's divided up into. Um, the language is the same, so now what teachers are seeing in the 7th and the 8th grade is kids are coming through, they're very uh, familiar with the language, they're familiar with the process of writing conferences, they're familiar with the uh, revisioning and the drafting opportunities, the, the mapping that goes on beforehand or, or uh, pre-thinking, pre-writing activities, so they're into a format and a flow that's extremely helpful. Um, Jamie has also worked with uh, and trained over 40 parents to come in and help out with um, writing conferences because we have really, I'm going to say probably in the last three years, the writing, the quantity of writing alone has probably doubled. Um, and, and Jeff uh, Shett could also uh, give testament to that because he's seen the examples either from, uh, from uh, his own children or he's seen that as the English language arts facilitator for the K-12, to um, so we're, we're really proud of the work that's happened there. Um, besides the writing, other examples would be the uh, readers' theaters, it would be the uh, literature circle groups where students have some self-selection, uh, because the idea is the whole class novel certainly serve a purpose, but they're just a component, and they, they had kind of become a really easy fallback uh, way to get at good conversations with kids, but it became too much. The pendulum swung too far the other way, and it started to be a fairly consuming strategy for us. And so now we, we've swung back, and where students have the opportunity within a class to actually select the kinds of books that they're reading, to work with other students, um, and to have conversations so when kids say, well, I get the critical thinking that I need to have from my peers, in this. The answer is, we've got lots of different levels within any classroom. I don't care if it's an LA or an ALA, we still have different variations of leveling and thinking and readiness and so forth. So they'll have the opportunity there. Um, we've also been doing common readings from Nancy Atwell, Kelly Gallagher primarily. Uh, Jamie, what else should I throw up there for a quick example? 
started out when <clears throat> we... You want to step up here so yeah. I can hear you? I can tell you do. It's in where you can um, it's, it started out actually in 2007 preparing for this moment, although at the time we didn't know we were preparing for this moment, we were just trying to approve literacy instruction and begin to write a curriculum. And uh, three teachers who are still in the system, Therese Roberts, uh, Allison Hawks, and Susan Deves and I, plus another teacher who's since retired, we gathered and we looked at some articles that I gathered and some research that I looked at. What can we do to improve our instructional strategies? And so that's, that's part of our written curriculum templates is a list of instructional strategies, and which includes some of these things that you see here. And uh, then um, we just started having meetings, professional development group, book groups, as Steve said. We've read a, a few books in common and uh, some articles. We've had a sharing session on literature circles with Pond Cove teachers. We've done a lot of homegrown professional development and reading to help us try things out in the classroom. And I think most importantly, we've shared with each other. Uh, we've helped each other move along towards what we know are the best instructional practices for teaching language arts. And that's how we're preparing for this change of no longer having accelerated language arts. Our goal really is to uh, teach aim at the top and all children will learn. I think Margaret said it very well Thursday night at our meeting. Um, what else did I want to say? I didn't prepare any remarks. That's all right. I think this, this, this piece right here on the data informed decision, data informed decision making is important. Uh, a few years ago, we didn't really have tools that could help us think about where kids were, whether it was on literary elements, fluency, uh, whatever the topic happened to be. And now we have many more tools like the NWEAs that can break our reading scores down into to four subcategories, formerly six, and we can look within those, we can see the writ ranges that the students are at, and it will say to us, the student that you have tested at this writ range and is prepared to do these skills. The students, that means the student already has these skills in his or her cache, and that means the student is progressing towards these skills. So it's very, it, it is a great helpful tool in the Descartes on the NWEAs that allows teachers to be able to use that information to directly put into their instruction as they're doing it. Um, we really haven't seen that level of specificity before. And we also, the NWEA scores are, um, looking at those, we noticed a relative weakness in informational reading. We, our students in the middle school do really well at animalizing literature. Uh, relative weakness in reading nonfiction. So that's why the Comprehension Toolkit is becoming part of our fifth and sixth grade program. We're taking, we're carving time out of fifth and sixth grade to uh, do an even better job of teaching comprehension strategies. So there are all sorts of things that we've been doing, including attending various conferences when we can, and to work up to this time period where we're ready to use the latest and the best instructional strategies for literacy. I don't know if I answered everything you wanted. John? The commonality of resources is going, to, is going to be a great boon to us and it started to be this year as well, that there are common practices. What's really nice is a change that didn't used to be in place. When I was teaching eighth grade science a number of years ago, I would feel like kids came from several different school systems, not just several different rooms because there was no commonality of experience and curriculum. And uh, Rick Wormelli referred to it the other day as, as hobby curriculum. What did the teacher have? There wasn't one in place, so what did the teacher have for an interest and, and invest a lot of time in? His happened to be uh, deep sea squid, and so he did a lot of that work with his kids. Um, for, for our school, I consider it more like the, the, the curriculum of the sacred cows then what was it that you really became extremely passionate about? And that's the kind of options that students had, which was all good stuff, but there, were no, there was no consistency. Kids could come in, Julia could come in, and, and Mac could come in, and they could have, I could say, oh, I know who you had in the fifth and the sixth and seventh grade in science, and I know who you had, and now let's see, what do you have in common? Not a lot. So we feel that there's uh, uh, at least 60% common experience. The literature anthologies provide us uh, quick opportunities to teach elements of literature as well rather than the whole class novels that take six to eight weeks to move 
which is sometimes can be like watching paint dry. Um, so I, I, most of the concern around this, this change has come from um, parents of kids who are in the ALA program now or the students themselves. Yeah. Um, I think I understand the, the idea of collapsing upward, um, but what's less clear to me, and, and I think you might help the people in the audience as well understand, is how is this the best thing for the students who are in the ALA, ALA program now? Well, I think what parents, what, what I typically hear from parents of students who are in the Accelerated Language Arts program is that their kids have meaningful discussions, they enjoy the books they read, uh, they have the opportunities to write to open-ended prompts, they have uh, good feedback on that information, can do revisions, produce quality writings that they're, that they're proud of. Um, I think that they are able to move at a, uh, at a rapid pace as well. All of those things that I've just said can and will still exist in the middle school curriculum for language arts. There's no change in that. If, if, uh, another way to look, in my view, the opportunity is to say that, that if we have 40% of our students who exceeded the standards in the kneecaps and 50% who met the standards, that range is so small comparatively uh, to most other school districts in the state, I don't care, in the country, that, that you would see quite a, 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 a breadth uh, or a, a width of ability levels or readiness points in the same classrooms. It just doesn't really exist here for the most part. Uh, there are students who need uh, direct support beyond what happens in, in the regular classroom. There are students who need um, accommodations and modifications, and those pieces all occur. But we're not talking about doing away with opportunities for any student. We're talking about adding opportunities for every student. OK. I have a question. Oh, thanks. Um, I have a question about the. Put your mic down. Sorry. About the process. When, if I understand, um, that you've been working towards, and we always, as great teachers, work towards the best curriculum. Where's the piece for parents' feedback? We, we give me a statement or under, help me understand when the parents get to have a feedback before the decision is made, or the students are told with their families for. Tell, just what, tell me about that piece. Or what was the last piece? Or when the students are told um, that this is not going to happen. Uh, when, what's the process for that? Well, I think, uh, first of all, is, is Jamie talked about in the time frames that we've been working on things, uh, probably three years ago now, I think we started actually making our first round of changes into the ALA because we did a, a, com a condensed group from a fifth grade and a sixth grade to a five-six combination. Um, also, we uh, in looking at a curriculum cycle, like what's a process that you need to go through for this, we do have a curriculum management plan. And the first step in that is, uh, after this work has been created, one of the, the next steps is to bring it to the curriculum coordinator for the district. You're looking at one of the curriculum coordinators. We no longer have a person in that position. Um, we also did, um, the, the next step is to bring it to the CIA team. The CIA team hasn't existed since October, maybe, I think it was the end of October we had our last meeting because of the, the budget freeze that occurred at the start of November, I think it was, Alan. And then a third step in that is uh, one of the pieces that came out in looking at the ELA um, report that Jeff Shedd and his uh, cohorts put together. It did discuss in there that the middle school staff was looking to promote the differentiation model of instruction for language arts classes, and that's been and is going to continue to be our focus. So I think that there have been some pieces in place. Now, naturally, I understand that if if I had said back on September 1st, next year we're going to, or if I had said on June 1st or August 1st or um, yesterday, whatever the date was, there are going to be some people who are going to look at that and say, I'm not concerned either way. There are going to be other people who are going to look at that and say, that's a change. And change can be very hard. 
because I know what I get with this, and I don't know what I get with this other piece. So um, I would say that the, the conversation was really pushed forward by the consideration about uh, some other structure or opportunities that were being uh, bantered about that Alan and the, and the district leadership team was promoting. So at that point, that's when the conversation started to occur, and then there were actually conversations that happened. If I could go back in time and say, well, let me, let me not have this come out first to parents and some conferences and so forth, let us prepare this and bring this to parents, that would have been the, the method that I would have chosen, but I can't um, turn that around. So I think that um, anytime you're, you're looking at substantial change and you're trying to be as, as open-minded and fair as possible, I, I think I could talk about this and present cases and cases and cases, and, and some people may say, I get it, let's see what happens. And other people may still say, I don't care what it is. I don't want this change. It's just not going to work for me. Uh, but we, we're, as a staff, we're to the point where we're saying, we really feel compelled that it takes a, a lot of courage and a lot of preparation and a lot of desire and effort to be able to make that next step. And this, because of some of the way that some of the conversations worked out, we said, this is the time to make the move. Uh, we did have a meeting Thursday night. We did listen. I have received a lot of information prior to that from parents. I've answered every question that's been put before me, and I'll post those also online as the attachments so that people can see the, the responses that I've given. Um, we're not, I, I, I'm not hiding anything, for instance. It's no, I just was curious. Just, just to let everybody know. Right. It's all, you know, okay, transparent, whatever, <laughs> whatever word we want to use. Thank you. Any questions? David? Um, I'm not sure the format, but I have a couple questions, and then I'd like to let everybody else ask whatever questions, and then I think we should, as a board, talk about what we think about this process and what we think about whether we, this program should be implemented next year. But I have a couple questions first, and I thought it would then be appropriate for us to talk about what we think. Well, we're in the question part, so why don't you go ahead with that? That's what I was checking to see if we asked. Mm -hmm. Well, just ask a question. Still in the question mode. Um, my understanding, Steve, is that from one of your charts and some, from other conversations, that if this program is implemented, it's going to be for a three-year period, whereby at the end of the thir thir third year, uh, the English language arts of people in the middle school probably maybe some people from the high school will be evaluate in the district team leadership will evaluate it and then take a look at uh, evidence-based data and present to the appropriate committees at, uh, of the board and ultimately to the board that this is a success, that it is working in the best interest of all students. That's how I interpreted that. Is that correct? This, the curriculum cycle is a five-year plan. So if this is year one after the ELA, presentation, so this is the year one, so years two, three, and four will be the years that we'll be observing the, the data trends that we see in that, and so year five will be uh, curriculum review for the entire K-12 to English language arts, and we'll do our review at exactly the same time. So it's not in three years, it's in four years? We'll do three years worth of data, we'll collect information over the three years, and in order to do that, for instance, the, uh, some of the data that we'll have, like the, NW, the spring NWEAs, won't be out until the end of the third school year. Is it, so you think that you need, and uh, this is a question, you need <clears throat> three years of data to really figure out whether or not uh, this program is working, and by working I mean it's, it's the best thing for all of our, our students. Uh, and then you won't be able to do that until the end of three years, so you'll evaluate that in the fourth year? Well, of course it'll be ongoing, the information that we have, whatever data points we have. We'll be gathering um, fall and spring NWEAs and common writing assessments, and we'll have the fall kneecaps that I'll get the results on usually around, uh, well, I guess it's going to happen around January. So we'll have ongoing information that we'll use to tweak what's actually happening at the time and to inform our direct instruction. But the, the goal would be that we do a, a 
a large systemic review of our entire language arts program uh, literacy across the content area as well in the what would be the for the English language arts folks would be the fifth year of their program. I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is that I know people can and I'm concerned about the process to date and I'll talk about it but I think if without stating my conclusions that if what I thought I heard, what I thought I saw, and I want to make it clear to the public that this is going to be evaluated and assessed continually over a three to four year period. Mm -hmm. A report will be presented, it will go through the normal committee process. Uh, um, I assume, hopefully, it will be a very favorable report, and it'll, but it will go up through the committee process to the school board and we'll say, yep, it's working, we're going to continue with this process. Is that a fair summary? Great summation. <laughs> Um, that, that's important to me because I want to assure people that this isn't something that's just going to get sprung. We're not going to pay attention to it. And I want, however I state my feelings, I'm looking right at the teachers now. Uh, you're, if, if this thing is approved, your feet on the, is right in the fire. And you spoke very passionately about this. And um, I don't want to tip my hand too much, but very eloquently and quite frankly, we expect, I expect in three or four years that you'll prove yourself. Okay. If you don't, it's, it's David, up to you. David, do you have um, a second question before we get into the conclusion part? I'll, if I put a question mark at the end of that, would that be okay? No. <laughs> All right. Um, I have a, I'm also curious about whether or not there's another way for people. If I was in fifth grade, and some say I'm, I'm still in there, um, and I wanted to say, I, I shown my teachers that this is really just too easy for me. Am I allowed? Or could we change it so that that person could take a sixth grade or even a seventh grade uh, English language arts course? I mean, is there anything to prevent a kid who really feels they're being held back to go for that one class, go to a higher grade? Two things on that. One is if uh, next year, if we provide you the opportunity, which we will, to come in and look at what we mean by differentiated instruction. If that's working properly, then the example you gave isn't going to occur, okay? And then the second thing is, from a, from a, a building-wide look at that, to take a student who's operating, who for some reason, let's say there's an example of that, and to move that student, locks two grades into one schedule for that student to be able to go access that different language arts at the same time period because the student can't access it when his or her math or social studies or science or allied arts or whatever else is going on, lunch period for instance. That, that's, asked, that's, that's quite, a, you know, quite an idea to say let's, let's schedule two grades in to lock them into a schedule for a, a, one single student's needs when there must be other ways we can meet those needs. And the differentiated instruction is the technique that I'm referring to. Quite frankly, I was looking to see if there's possible ways for uh, doing both on, a, on if there's some exceptional student. I see some. Do you want to? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, would you have to, 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 have to come to the podium? I just. Just as a teacher, um, if that student's sitting in my classroom, there's no need to send them to another class. If, if a student is ready for open heart surgery, then I'm, it's, my, it's my professional obligation to do whatever it takes to make sure that... You're not going to do the open heart surgery. <laughs> <laughs> After this, I'm going to need some myself. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, every teacher has an obligation. And as a board, you, you approve teachers to work for this district based on the assumption that we're going to do whatever it takes. I mean, if you're telling me that I need to ship a kid off to a, a class because it's called something, whether it's grade seven math, grade seven language arts, accelerated math, which I teach in sixth grade, unfortunately. Um, you know, if, if I need that to happen in order to teach students, then why am I a teacher? I mean, it, you could call the class pottery, and you know, if a kid wants to come in and you know, they want to differentiate equations and do integrals, and, and they're in seventh grade, sixth grade, whatever, for me to ignore that would be, I mean, just blatantly irresponsible. So I think the whole idea of differentiation, just from my perspective, again, I teach an accelerated program in math, is that you, know, you, don't, you don't need the class to be called something for learning to happen. And you, know, you, you, sort of, you meet every kid where they're at, whether it's you know, 
to use a, a bad analogy, whether it's up here or here or here. Um, anyway, I just wanted to add that. I mean, I'm due to speak later, but that's kind of part of what I'm going to say. Too, so. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. We, we have to, yeah, I, I know, please continue the conversation, but not while we're trying to have a board meeting, because um, we do have a really big agenda tonight. Um, so, so in essence, Steve, the answer is it's not possible schedule-wise. I understand the differentiation works. You're kicking me under the table. You're staring at me. I'm a, I deliberately didn't want to look at her. So the answer is no. No on the schedule. But yes, I mean the students okay. in the classroom. Thank you. That is what I wanted was my answer. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, at this time, I'd like to see if board members have anything that they would like to um, say in relation to um, the proposed changes. Kate. I know. Um, Steve, I was wondering, and um, the teachers, and to uh, the board, because we got the budget, because I heard this review after I got the budget, I would like to make a recommendation or uh, a recommendation that we put in the budget a book group or a book talk like is done in the high school for the students who passionately feel, is this appropriate? who passionately feel that their ELA experience was, um, they would like to continue it. And so any child who would like to go into a book group at a different time, taught by either one of the teachers in the stipend position, that's? Well, okay, so conceptually I think it's perfectly fine that you bring this up, but um, unless you're planning on facilitating that, um, it probably needs to um, be something that the administrators and teachers would discuss as to whether that is a feasible, um, a feasible thing to do and whether that's how they would choose to allocate some of their budget resources. But That's right, I wanted to bring it up to But you, what so. I would suggest is <clears throat> that you hold on to that thought and bring it up um, when we get to the budget discussion. Um, and we can kind of flesh that out a little bit. Anybody else? I hear whispering over there. Whisper, whisper. No? no? Okay. no. Mary? Um, I think what I'd like to say is um, I, I went to the conference, or I went to the, the meeting on Thursday, last Thursday night, and um, heard the teachers speak very passionately about this. And I have a lot of faith in our English teachers. Um, and I have personally seen um, acceler accelerated work in differentiated classrooms in a different school, and I know it works. And I know it, you know, I have complete faith in our teachers to do um, what's best for our children, and I found it interesting that they felt that perhaps the accelerated program wasn't best practice. Um, for all kids. Um, I believe in language arts classes, um, all students have something to offer, um, not just those who are gifted um, in their test scores or gifted um, by, you know, by achieving at you know, a certain writing prompt. Um, I think Steve's um, comment about where our kids are academically, that we have 90% of kids who meet or exceed um, the standards, really speaks to what sort of learning we can have in classrooms. Um, and so I feel confident in, in giving this a, a run um, and would support it, um, particularly given who we have at the helm. I have a lot of faith in them. Um, and. Um, you know, I've been in the system for many, many years, and my kids have had a lot of these teachers and unfortunately haven't had some of them. Um, so um, I would support, yeah, I, I definitely support what the teachers are trying to do here and, and applaud them for trying to t think out of the box and take things to a different level. Thank you, Mary. Anybody else like to say anything? I would. I'm kind of surprised nobody else wants to say anything, but... Um, I have good news and bad news on my beliefs, and depending on which side of the spectrum you'll find it's good news or bad news. 
Um, I'm very disappointed in the process that was followed. Um, I think this thing made it unnecessarily confrontational, unnecessarily argumentative in our town. We have a lot of issues in this town, especially the most important one being the budget. I would have expected this to go through what I would consider a normal process through committees, have, have people make a proposal, go through committees, um, have input from the public, have input from the board, have input from the teachers, discuss it over time. And quite frankly, when you do something like that, you get the public behind you. And as one of our goals and one of our teaching models say, that one of the best ways kids learn is when their parents are behind it, when their parents are involved. And I think it's critical to get parents involved. And I think this thing came at very late notice and although a lot of data has been given to us lately, I don't, I, I don't find the data persuasive. Um, I think a lot of it's bare correlations, um, uh, not fact-based. However, um, and I do, and I am going to introduce uh, within a, 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 a change policy that's used in um, Yarmouth uh, to when we want to change something, we go through a process. Because I'm a firm believer in my 30 years of practicing law that when you involve everybody and they get to listen to you like I did and they get to see what you had to say, and I happen to know several of you, I am sure most of the people in this town, most of the emails I got would have been supportive. Um, now, my view is um, that I support it. That might sound surprising given my preamble, but I do. The reason I support it is the teacher's presentation in Steve's presentation. I thought it was extremely passionate. I think it was uh, well thought out. I have extreme confidence in our middle school teachers. My son has had several of you. Um, I also think our accelerated language program has defects. It's too small. It doesn't cover the number of intelligent people we have in this town, uh, children we have in this town, and I think it's been un unnecessarily exclusive. If I could, I'd make three of them. But I think the best solution now to try is this differentiated learning program where kids of all types get together. I, I have been convinced that you can teach at multiple levels within a class. And I think that'll be good for all our students, including the most intelligent. And I think the cutoff lines we now for, for accelerated language and ones who don't make it in is so artificial as to be meaningless. A lot of very bright people don't get in. I think this is the best chance for all of our bright kids, our middle level kids, and our lower level kids to get the best learning. But I, I fully expect a report, go through channels, and come up to the board at three or four years, whatever is the proper time, to show me that you've, that you've done it. I believe you can do it. I truly do. And that's why I'm, I'm supporting this. Um, I haven't listened to a lot of arguments on both sides, but I firmly support it. But I, you feed it to the fire. I want you, I expect you to be able to do the job. I know you'll be able to do the job, but you're going to have to give me proof uh, in three to four years so I can stand up in this town and say, yes, it worked. I think but that's my speech. Okay. Anybody else? Kathy? Um, I, I did not get a chance to see last Thursday's presentation. I apologize. I was out of town. Um, and so tonight is my first chance to take a look at it, and I know we've gotten a lot of emails from parents. Um, I have some concerns about those emails. Um, the tone of some of those emails was concerning to me in that I wasn't sure I liked some of the reference that some parents made about um, I don't want my child to be in with the regular children, the normal children, and that bothered me. Having said that, um, I'm not an educator, and with the exception of one member of the board, neither are the rest of us. I beg your pardon. I got three. I excuse me. Two members of the board. <laughs> Apologize, um, but I do like and I do try to always support the people who are educators. And if the administration and the teachers say that this is a program that they think is worthwhile and should be done, then I support that. Um, and I think that's really because, again, this is sort of my first blush at looking at it. I, I don't feel it's my job to um, 
pick it apart uh, and and try to analyze it because I'm, I have a business background. So, um, so I do support what the um, educators and the administration want to do with this. Thank you, Kathy. Anybody else? Oh. John. <laughs> John, go ahead. Better. Sorry, you were looking at this end of the table earlier. Um, well, I would just say that I, I would support um, uh, the concept of a, of a, um, a, a well-thought-out change process such that um, the, this kind of thing um, doesn't come as a surprise to the board and the community. Um, I, I did attend um, the meeting the other night, and I was um, also impressed with the, with the passion of the teachers. Um, I'll, I'll say I found it regrettable as a board member, particularly on budget night, that this was a group of teachers that talked about um, doing, um, <clears throat> doing professional development book study groups in their own time if only they had the money for the books um, that they needed to, to read to do those um, study groups. And, um, I, and that's just a part of um, the passion that they showed for um, for this, this approach. But what particularly, I think, impressed me um, was, the, um, was the idea that, that, um, that Steve touched on, which is that in middle school, students are learning about what kind of learner they are. Um, and that if we um, track those students and tell them that they're accelerated learners or not accelerated learners, we're sending a message about learning, which is that um, the brain is a, is, is a gift and either you've, you know, you've got one that works well or you don't. And, and um, I think that that's the wrong message to send in middle school. Um, and and uh, I think that instead we want to tell these students that if they work hard, they, they, the brain is more of a muscle. If we work it hard, um, it will get stronger. Um, so I, I, for that reason, I, I think um, and as well as the reason that Kathy articulated that, that these, these are the educators and, and, uh, and, and uh, I respect your, your professional point of view. I would also support the change. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm just going to add a couple of quick comments that I like John's analogy as far as the brain is the muscle. Um, I was going to make some comments to the effect that kids in middle school are going through quite a growth spurt there's a lot of changes happening to them physically, I believe also emotionally and mentally. Um, these teachers have done a tremendous amount of work on this program. They're not entering into this um, frontier blindly. And I, I'm pleased to see the eagerness that they're willing to take on this challenge. Um, they are the experts in this field. I do believe that you've I've seen through my own children, I've seen some of this already happening in the classroom, even though it hasn't formally been in, in a process. So I'm actually looking forward to this process going forward. So again, I support you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, I'd like to just say a couple of things. Um, I, I look at this more as a collaborative um, exercise than um, perhaps our fellow board member uh, David Hillman does. I, I, I'm very I'm uncomfortable with terms used of where your feet are to the fire, I expect you to, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I think that we're all in this together. I think we're, um, unfortunately, this would be better in a workshop environment, it would be a little bit more informal where we could have a give and take and a discussion. Um, I would. I would say that it's clear to me that you have put a lot of thought and research and effort into this. Um, and again, I'll reiterate what everybody else said to you, I trust your um, professionalism and your expertise. Um, and that I know that you are doing this to help our students that would never um, consider anything that would be detrimental to any of our students. Um, and that part of your practice is um, ex examination, self-examination as a teacher, uh, self-examination as a, as a department, and self-examination as a school. Um, that is integral to the operations of our district, and it's something that has been institu institutionalized over the past several years. 
Um, regrettably, one thing that hasn't quite been firmly institutionalized is something fairly new to the school board and to the school district, and that's the Teaching and Learning Committee. Um, and we, this was started last spring as a way to bring school board administrators and teachers together in an analysis of curriculum areas um, and to discuss not only the actual curriculum materials instruction but also resources um, and sort of an analysis of performance and we've had several pres we've had three presentations now um, one of which was Excel uh, which was English language arts um, it was the second presentation it was earlier in the year and um, looking back I can see how uh, this would, that would have been a really excellent vehicle um, to bring this um, pr uh, proposal or idea for change forward and could have led to a um, more robust, less time constrained, perhaps less emotional um, discussion about uh, the process of accelerated lang language arts in our curriculum. Um, so I'm hopeful that as we get more comfortable with teaching and learning, um, the role that it can play in terms of the discussion of curriculum and instructional practices, um, that these types of situations won't, won't, happen, to, won't happen again. Um, and I know that from conversations with Alan and, and Steve that that is indeed the intent. Um, so having said that, I, you know, I am very comfortable with the proposal um, and um, thank the teachers and administrators for all their time and effort that they put into this. And um, I look forward to um, seeing it implemented and um, maybe we could have a periodic report now, now and again, not wait for four years, but um, just have maybe a touchstone um, mid-year next year or something because I know that probably as we go through it some questions will arise okay so moving on and is Lily still here, she is here. oh thank you you guys left and then you came back Uh, just a few, why don't you come on up for a second. <laughs> We've had you here for an hour now, you can come up. <laughs> I was saying at 7.30, I said, uh, Lily's going to be here in just a minute. Um, so uh, you're, you're going on to represent the this, this state of Maine. Is it June 20th or what? No, um, the piece starts June 2nd. June 2nd. Huh. I knew there was a two in there. So you're going to be down in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And then when you win the, the national competition, then you meet Barack Obama and whoever <laughs> else you choose. Yeah. All right. Um, what are your plans after that? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you would just come from what? Softball practice? Yeah. Okay. So which one's your, your primary passion? Is softball or, or spelling? I don't know. I like both. You do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations and thanks. We appreciate you coming in tonight. Okay, great. All right, moving on to instructional practice of team teaching. <laughs> before, I, uh, before I start, I just wanted to point out this document I gave you. The, the first page is what I'll be quickly trying to read through. I told my wife I'd leave at 8. So I wanted you to send her a quick email on talking. I'd really appreciate it. Um, and Adam just had, Adam and his wife just had a baby last week. So yeah. <laughs> I'm sure she's counting the minutes. <laughs> um, thank you. And, and the rest of this I won't go into too much. It, it's just I didn't want to leave any doubt. And what all these statements are are direct um, excerpts from lots of different uh, leading uh, books on, on research, middle level practice, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's by far uh, not all I could have put down in the four and a half hours I spent on this yesterday. But I felt like if I didn't stop, I'd, I'd still be on my laptop typing. Um, so you know, promise me that you'll ask me any questions if I don't, if I don't um, get to your concerns. 
Um, I just wanted to start by saying that a lot of what I'm going to talk about doesn't appear on a curriculum document um, for this for this district um, and in many states um, or you know for the in the country for that matter. Um, and, and the term I want you to remember is is the, the term developmentally responsive. And I, I want to start just a quick story. Um, just about five and a half years ago, I was at the Maine Conservation School with a group of sixth graders, and it, it's very similar to Chuanke, where I was sort of the, the teacher in the background, and then there's a counselor, and the counselor would challenge a group of kids to start a fire, and that's all I said. He said, go into the woods, you know what a fire looks like, right? I said, sure. Go into the woods, get some wood, and start a fire, and the kids were like, you know, okay, whatever, that's easy. So I went in the woods, and they knew what a fire looked like, big, huge thing, huge logs, you know, burning, and um, they came back with these three, four foot long logs, six to 10, 12 inches in diameter, put them all down in a big, big pile. They had a little book of matches. And they took turns holding the match under this giant <laughs> pyre of, of wet, rotten wood. While the counselor and I kind of stood off to the side and, and, and had a, a nice little chuckle. So you can imagine how ridiculous that looked. Um, and how that relates to being developmentally responsive is, is what those kids had, had forgotten in their um, hyper focus on what they wanted that fire to look like once it was done. They've forgotten what makes a good fire in the first place and they forgot to, to address the needs of, of that fire and, and helping it grow for where it was, which it was, you know, a, a random collection of you know, hemlock boughs and, you know, a few matches out of a book that, you know, came from a hotel somewhere. So, just remember that um, as I go through here, and I'll go as quickly as I can. I kind of made a, a, a list of ten things, and this comes from, I've worked in middle level education for eight years, uh, and, and I've, my concentration on masters, which is almost complete, is in middle level education, and I have all the experience to go with it, which, you know, what does that matter? Um, the first point I'd like to make is adolescence is the most rapid period of growth that anyone experiences, other than um, birth to age three years. And that the, the cruel truth about adolescence is that when you're a toddler, you're not aware of the changes as they happen. You know, they just happen. And, you know, you eat your Cheerios and drink your milk and whatever. But when you're 12, when you're 13, you're painfully aware of it. And that, that, that kind of leads into my next, my next point is that d due to that unique stage, um, adolescents have an innate desire and, and requirement to see their education in terms of its connectedness with their opening world. And by opening world, I mean when you're a kid, seven, eight years old, I mean even, I mean I see kids now who are 11 and 12, you come to school with bedhead and it's like whatever, it looks like somebody scared you when you woke out of bed, um, when you woke up and got out of bed. And you sort of had this childish abandon of you know, not caring what people think. Once you start to become aware of these changes, it's the exact opposite. And it's really easy um, to be isolated and feel alienated, and that can greatly affect your development. Um, small teams, so nine, neither of those two points had anything to do with teams, so here we go. Small teams of students and teachers allow uh, close relationships between adults and children to develop. Uh, those relationships allow students to feel safe, and they're more willing to take positive risks and help stimulate their own learning. And capitalize, italicize, bold, underline the word own. Um, the motivation comes from them. Uh, teaching fewer classes of the same subject allows the teacher to maintain a crisper, more focused and adaptable style of instruction that is not inherently drawn toward less creative teaching styles such as direct instruction. And I want to say that again. I teach two math and two science. If I had to teach four math in one day, by that fourth math class I could care less what 2x plus 4 equals. I'm just going to, I mean, it, and it's, it's a truth. I mean, you know, at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, whether you're a business major or a lawyer or whatever, when you're drained, you're not at your best. And that happens really quickly and really easily when you have to focus on nothing but the same subject. Um, teaching another subject also allows you, you know, in your own little part of your team, to see connections between, immediately between the two subjects you teach. Um, you know, obviously I teach math and science. That's a really easy way to, um, to connect two subjects. Unfortunately, a lot of my opportunity to connect those two is lost by the fact that I don't see many of my math students in science because they're in the accelerated class. And I see the regular kids 
um, from Elizabeth Johnson's um, homeroom in my science class. So I just wanted to kind of march that elephant out there. Um, <laughs> another thing um, that that teaming does is allows common planning time between um, teachers on a small team with open discussion regarding their practices. The discussion can often lead to ideas and strategies that would have otherwise not been implemented by a teacher working in isolation from other subject areas. And that doesn't, that's not like a formal thing. Sometimes if I have a quick question, I'll go to my teaching partner and just, you know, ask her opinion or she'll do this, the same. Sometimes we'll just kind of think out loud and, and talk about what we're doing. You know, it's nothing major. Um, we don't have a committee or a process for that. It just kind of happens, and it happens because of the teaming structure. Um, and, and I just want to kind of quickly say, when I say team, I mean a teaching team is in, we work together to teach students the curriculum. It's not a team like I, I might meet with other math teachers and we talk about well, how do you approach math and you know, what, what do you need them to be able to do next year in general and blah, blah, blah and all that. So it's, it's a little bit different idea of team. I just wanted to make sure that I was being clear about that. Working more intimately with another partner also allows um, teachers to develop instructional approaches that make connections across content areas. These connections deepen and authenticate what can often appear as disconnected subject areas to most students. And a quote that is probably my favorite, and it was on the letterhead of the middle school I worked at for three years in Great New Gloucester, and it's from uh, William Butler Yates, and it's edu education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And the fire anecdote at the beginning was not intended to match up with that, but as someone who went to a junior high school, which is what we have here in Cape Elizabeth, I went from class to class with my pail, and the teachers filled it up for 45 minutes, and then I left. And another quote from, um, from, from B.F. Skinner about education is what survives when what has been learned has been forgotten. I don't remember a single thing from middle school. What I do remember is how I felt going from class to class, having my pail filled, and not feeling like I had one teacher who knew me well. Um, that's affected me my entire life. That's why I'm a middle school teacher right now and not a chemical engineer, which is what my um, degree is in. Um, it's on eBay, by the way, if you want to buy it. Um, <laughs> I've got two kids who aren't potty trained right now. So, um, and, and just another story about, about the connectedness between subjects. Th this happened this year, and, and it connects to the accelerated language arts question. I, I don't want, if I had a, a student that, I, I don't believe in change for the sake of change. And a, a student in that class, that's what it is at this point, or that's what it can seem like. But what they're going to gain, nothing's going to change. I'm confident. I, I don't have any doubt. Nothing's going to change them in terms of what they learn, and that's the most important thing. But what they'll gain is a really a, a, an opportunity, and this happened early this year when I gave a writing assignment in science, and part of my preparation was to develop a rubric. And I kind of wanted to know if there was anything my partner had used before and we had a conversation to develop something. And when I actually went to present it, the kids had a portion to do in my class and in her class. I had a handful of kids who didn't have her for language arts. And for them, because they had such a volume of work, and these kids, if you could see the stress level um, that they experience on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, I see it at school every single day. When they heard that they had another assignment to do for science that sort of added to their language arts pile, it was a completely... Um, meaningless and disconnected um, stressor for them. And what I really believe kids like that will gain is an opportunity for their teachers to capitalize on the fact that you know, they know their teacher's language arts expectations, they know their teacher's science expectations, I know my partner's expectations. It's, it's the whole curriculum at once. It's not these disconnected areas. Um, and kids need that at this age. Like I said, they're, they're waking up, they're seeing the world differently. Uh, they're social learners, and, and that needs to be capitalized on. If it isn't, we're not being developmentally responsive. Um, seven, rather than assign time for advisory and guidance, small teams encourage the development of advisory all the time. Because teachers and students know each other so well, opportunities for social and emotional teaching that appear at unexpected times throughout the school day can be capitalized on. And I'll tell you from experience, two years of having a separate period called advisory with my kids. If it isn't a game, I might as well not even bother because that's what kids learn to see it as. And a lot of kids sort of see, and I'm, I'm not, I, I'm a total supporter of, of advisory, but when it's a class, especially when kids are going from A to B to C to D throughout the, out the day, um, 
if F happens to be advisory, they're going to walk in and it's going to be another class and they're going to hand out their pails and wait for it to be filled. So in, in a, in a, that's a blanket statement. I realize it may not apply to every student, but I do know that those advisory all the time moments when you see a conversation that happens at recess between, between two students or one that happened um, to me recently when a student said he didn't want to be in language arts with all the dumb kids. Um, those, little, those little things that come up throughout the day, you don't file them in a folder that says save for advisory on Friday. You know the students so well that you can, you can capitalize, them, capitalize on them right, right away. And again, I'm not saying it doesn't happen in our current model. I know, you know just being a teacher, you want to get to know your students. But when you have 44 kids, as I do, versus 120 kids, as some teachers do, I mean, it's just a probability exercise in terms of how likely it is you'll be able to know each student well enough to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, this is an important point. Many students do not fully develop areas of the brain responsible for self-organization and long-term planning until later in high school, in some cases well into high school and beyond into college. Having fewer core teachers to balance enhances student success by reducing the amount of organizational expectations they must master while also allowing team teachers to develop skills with the kids that will help them in later grades. So if we're worried about what the fire is going to look like in four years and what they need to do in high school, if you've got two teachers that know each student so well that they can learn their style and give them suggestions on how to adapt it and set up organizational systems and study skills to help them succeed, then they're just going to be more successful in high school. I mean, I, it, 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 to me, it sells itself, um, but I, I, I've seen a lot of kids that struggle. Um, you kind of you go to, to the nursery and you buy a tree, and you want the tree to grow up as tall and strong as possible. You don't want to put it in the ground and not water it, not stake it, not feed it, because those are the conditions it'll have to handle in five years, ten years, when it's a full-grown tree. You, you want to do everything you can in your power to work with that tree and help, help it develop, and, and that really applies very strongly to study skills and organization and just long-term thinking. You know, a lot of big, one of the big reasons why we look back at things we did when we were 13, 14, 15 years old and, and think, what was I thinking? It's because you don't have the skills to think, all right, um, you know, if I throw mud at my, my friend's house at 1030 at night and then run away, maybe that's not such a good idea because he might call the police on me. Um, that, that happened to me once, and I always wondered why I did it, and I, I never knew the answer. Um, but we, don't, we, don't have, we, we just don't have that ability. And I was, I was 17 when they did that, so... Um, uh, second to last year, two defining characters of characteristics of adolescence are the invisible audience, which is the feeling that everyone is watching your appearance and behavior all the time, no matter what. And the second is called the personal fable. And I'll be honest with you, those terms were in a book somewhere. And it may have been uh, Rick Romali, I don't know. Um, and I've always remembered them because I think they, in, in two terms, I think they summarize adolescence, which is a hard thing to do. The, the personal fable is the sense that you're the only one going through those changes and no one understands what you're going through. And as I said before, it's really easy to feel alienated and isolated when you're an adolescent, and when that happens, really, really, really bad things um, are a result of that. Not just from the academic sense, as in, you know, why try? Why put any effort? But just, you know, why should I behave? Why should I make smart decisions? Why should I choose a certain, uh, to, to hang out with certain people? That's, it's a domino effect, and those two things need to be remembered. Um, smaller teams help students avoid that alienated, alienated feeling that can be easily produced by giving all students a sense that at least one or two adults um, closely understands and cares about them. And I'm not a big touchy-feely guy, but I have to recognize that, that because I was a student that went to school with my pail, and I felt like there wasn't a single teacher that knew me other than Adam, the English student, the algebra student, the history student. I was just, you know, that's who I was. I wasn't Adam the person. And, you know, at this, at this age, it's, it's extremely important that we don't ignore that. And the last point I'd like to make, students who have experienced the caring, supportive, small team environment are better prepared to succeed in high school since they have had several years of consistent, guided, academic, social, and emotional development. 
Um, and like I said before, being developmentally responsive, you, you'll see it. But when we talk about curriculum, we have a science committee, we have a math committee, um, we have a social studies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, everything I just said, we don't have a committee for that. And th there's a reason why the state of Maine now has an endorsement for middle level education. There's a reason why there's a national middle school association. And it's because of the unique needs of these kids. Teaming is just a small part of that. Uh, I'll acknowledge that. But it, implementing the structure through middle school is a step in, in becoming a middle school and not a junior high school. I firmly believe that we are not minor leagues for the high school. Um, like I said, if, if I spent my time worrying about where kids needed to be um, for honors chemistry or I don't even know the classes of the high school, to be honest with you, I, I wouldn't be a very good teacher and I wouldn't work with these kids nearly as well as I do. I worry about where they're at now and I respond to their needs and, and I know what their needs are um, in, in a general sense. I mean, obviously there's getting to know them, but just from a, a, a personal example that's happening right now is, is finding daycares for my children. I'm not going to, I want a, a daycare that's going to be responding to, to the needs of my kids now, not based on where they might be in kindergarten. I don't even know what age they start kindergarten in Scarborough. I mean, it might be five, six, I don't know when the cutoff is. I'm just worrying about meeting their needs right now, and that's the approach that I have with my, with my middle school kids. Um, so I just had a few more things to make sure. A couple of things I wanted to just point out that I, I've heard Getting, I think there's a sense that s students need two years to be prepared to move between classes in high school. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't take a, 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 a bright student from Cape Elizabeth more than five minutes and a map to know where to go. Now, in terms of organizationally, I've already kind of spoke to that. Organizationally, it does take a considerable amount of work for kids to be able to balance the demands of high school. I, I know from experience, when I was a junior, I took five AP classes, pre-calculus. I worked at KFC Taco Bell for four hours, and I, I did indoor and outdoor track. And it was, it was a struggle. And I was sort of thrown into the fire, and I had to figure it out. But again, people who know kids well and can help them develop those skills, when they're open and receptive to having those skills developed, is a valuable thing. And the second thing is getting stuck, I, I think. Um, I, I agree with the fact that you're not going to have 99 or 95% or, or 95 of kids in a team who are happy and meant to be there, and I completely acknowledge that. Um, but the feeling of, of sort of being stuck with a certain team over, over a year, I just want to say that being a part of a team, a team is a more flexible and adaptable environment for a middle school kid to learn in. Um, if, if there's a, a problem with a student on, on our team, and we know that student well, and we can put changes in place for that student in terms of what's best for them much more efficiently, much earlier, much more effectively than we could if we only saw a student in math. We might not even be aware that there's an issue. Um, so I just want to, I, I think, and if you read the literature, I always feel smart when I say that, about middle level education, you'll, you'll see over and over again that you need to have with middle school kids an adaptable and a flexible structure to their school day. If it's rigid, if you don't have that adaptability and flexibility and teaming is a major way you achieve that, then you're doing them a real disservice and you're not being developmentally responsive to their needs. So um, just some bottom lines, and these will be the last four things I say. I've already said one. I don't believe we're a minor league for the high school. The second one, I've already said, being developmentally responsible. Um, the third thing, and, th and this is, I can say without, without doubt, utmost conviction, I'm a better teacher with a teaching partner than I would be if I was isolated. And if I were in your position or if I were a parent in the audience, that would be enough for me. I'd get up and leave. Because why would I want a teacher telling me that they're a worse teacher in, in that situation than they are in the teaming situation? And the last thing I want to say is that all these changes that I've talked about and that we've talked about are for the benefit of all students not 95% of the students for the sake of 5%. It's for 100% of the students. And, and that's something that everyone needs to remember. I wouldn't have taken as much time as I did tonight, <laughs> yesterday, and about 30 or 40 times in the shower over the past <laughs> two months on my way to work at 4.30 on a Saturday morning, at 4.30 in the morning that my wife was having a C-section. 
obsessing over these things and putting it together just right if I didn't think that it was for the benefit of all students. So that's the last thing I'll say. And thanks for listening. If you have any okay. questions, I'll be more than happy. Oh, and, and just a couple of oh, things. Sorry. I know we're, we're really yeah. pushing the time, but I, so I won't be long. Promise? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just, I think I only have two slides. He wants to say something. Sure. So next year, next year, the, in considering, there's, there's some things that, that what the teaming structure is and, what the, and some things that it is not that I want to talk to people about a little bit. And what we're talking about is trying to reduce the number of teachers that students see per day from six or seven. We have a six period day. I have some students today who saw seven teachers, seven in one day. Um, and we're trying to reduce that from six or seven to four or five. We're not talking about two. Uh, they see uh, their, their content area teachers. They see their world language teachers, allied arts. They see band instructors. And they go to an, uh, they go to a, an advisor or to a, to a, um, a study hall. Uh, so it, it's one of the things that it's not, I want to be very clear about this, it is not about traveling with the same group of students all day. So when people say, oh, wait a minute, fifth and sixth grade, you travel with it, that is not what we're talking about. What it is talking about is dealing with anywhere. It could be um, if, if we were looking at a team of three. See, this is the configuration that we're trying to figure out right now. If you were looking at a team of three people, you'd be talking about 60, 65 kids. If it was a team of four, you'd be talking about 85. If I happen to be able to construct a two-person team, it would be uh, 40, 40 to 45. And it would depend on, for a two-person team, I'd need to have a common math block that was off team. So there's, there's a few little variations in this, so that's why I'm being very general about it. But uh, right now, Aaron Filio sees 110 students in a day, and Chris Monez sees 111. 111 students that you want to give your undivided attention to in one day. Um, it is about organizing more interdisciplinary practices. From, for instance, uh, social studies and language arts assignments and projects could be aligned. That if you're doing a social studies, uh, a major paper in social studies, Guess what? It could actually connect to your language arts class. Um, it's about coordinating student and home communication, reducing the amount of teachers and websites and, and emails and so forth that people need to send out. Uh, it's about adolescent learning research. I think you had something to say on that. It's also about teachers being able to address individual learning needs and provide necessary interventions and support for each student because they will know their students better. And it's also about students and teachers setting and monitoring student learning goals together in order to help students achieve at high levels. And just uh, the, the National Middle School Association, along with the uh, document that I've mentioned before that's called Bright Futures from the State Department Commission on uh, Middle-Level Education, they're, they're both uh, in support of a, of a teaming structure because of some of the things that I've already said and also because uh, the schools found that fully engaged, schools that are fully engaged with teaming uh, and high levels of common planning time, because that's imperative. You've got to give people time to pull these things off and to be effective and to continue to learn um, while they're flying the plane. Show improvement in student self-reported outcomes, for instance, depression, self-esteem, behavior problems, academic efficacy. And as I've said over and over again, Middle school is about these kinds of things. It's about the social, emotional aspect first, and then everything else falls into place. Uh, what questions do people have for us? Hey, Julia, how are you doing? <laughs> There's a question to your left. No, just, sorry. Um, I guess I was just a little bit curious about the transition into the high school. I completely agree that the middle school shouldn't be like obsessed with preparing for the high, the kids for the high school because I think sometimes high school is obsessed with preparing kids for college. I don't think that's always productive. Um, 
and that it's really helpful when middle schools, especially when you're trying to finally balance stuff, that you are able to have your teachers coordinate assignments and stuff. Um, but what I was a little worried about is, I guess the teachers are always kind of, it's kind of a stepladder that, you know, in an elementary school you only have one teacher and then it breaks into a team mm -hmm. and then you have, a, you have a lot of teachers but you always have your constant advisor and then in high school you have like tons of teachers and I don't really understand, I feel like that would be too big of a leap to go from teacher, from having a team in eighth grade to having all these teachers in high school because, I mean, going into high school, talk about the invisible audience, it's now multiplied by four and people have facial hair. Like, it's so overwhelming to go to high school. <laughs> and I think that it does take more than five minutes to adjust. And I think a big part of that adjustment is having teachers that see you and they see seniors and they don't have any idea who you are and having so many of them. And that continues into college when it's up to you if your professor even knows your name. So. I think that's a really big jump to make. And also, uh, going along that same ladder, um, I know some, a lot of the excitement about middle schoolers going into high school is that finally their teachers are even more of experts in the area that they're teaching and more passionate about that. You know, if they're teaching chemistry all day, they really know chemistry. And I think if you feel like the teachers are able to apply that same passion in multiple subjects, that would be great but I don't know if that would be lost because I know a lot of the freshmen say one of the best parts about coming into high school is having teachers that really know what they're talking about inside and out of a subject. Um, I'd like to give you an example on one thing first, and that's that uh, before coming back to Cape Elizabeth, I was at, a, uh, the state, at the time, the second largest high school, but certainly the most complex and diverse high school, uh, that, that there aren't many other like it in, in Maine. And there were three middle schools that fed that. One that had uh, a program where um, the, the teacher might put on, the, a team of teachers would get together with their team of students. They'd put on the board, they'd say, this is the schedule that we have for this week. These are the things that we're working on. Uh, we're not going to get to social studies this week, or we won't get to science. We're doing these sorts of things. And it relates to these projects. So that was one middle school. Another middle school had uh, neighbor, uh, houses. And a third middle school had a structure like ours. Yet, on day one of the next school year, all three middle school styles of students with backgrounds came to the same high school. And within a day, knew the schedules better than I did. I'd be looking at, uh, uh, I'd be looking at some of the students saying, OK, you're who? And you go, I don't know them yet, as freshmen, for instance. So, um, and they'd say, yeah, well, no, I'm not there today because it's not a blue day, it's a white day, so I go to this particular class. So I found that it was, students are a heck of a lot more adaptable in that situation than I would be as an adult. So as far as kids making transitions, I don't really personally see that as, as a major stumbling, as a stumbling block. Also, by example, when you went to the middle school, we didn't have a rotating schedule. We didn't have a block A that was uh, locked in every day and then a B, C, D, E. Whoops, wait a minute, I don't have H. That's not today, that's tomorrow or, or whatever. We'll rotate that back. And yet you went to the high school. Has that been a stumbling block? Freshman year, definitely. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing, it gets a little bit more challenging every year. Okay. So I think. And, and you're going to adjust because you just haven't seen the structure. So, you know, it's not something that everybody loves in life. But, you but even, even like at step up day, I remember talking to freshmen and we just handed them out their schedule. Like, why are my periods with letters now? And they like, like they have no idea how to yeah. even conceptualize the fact that they wouldn't, they have all these different teachers. And right. I just, even there if they. have some plan of like preparing yeah. them for that. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then I just want to say, you had a second point there towards, what was the, towards the end? The teachers just being like passionate. Oh, oh, uh, first off, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to be wise about this, but I really don't think that middle school education is rocket science. I, I think, I mean, I did language arts, science, social studies, math in grades four, six, seven, and eight over a 17 year period. Mm -hmm. I loved every single subject particularly started to go more towards the math and sciences and, and thoroughly enjoyed those experiences. My favorite year uh, years were when uh, uh, Mary Beth and I were teaming on some subjects 
in the sixth grade, and then after that I went to uh, a self-contained for a few years where I could do immersion throughout the, the subject areas. I, I just thought it was thrilling. Um, somebody who has a background in science, let's take Michael Efren, for example. I'll bet his background in math is as steep as his background in science. I can't see. When I have a question in math, I teach it at, a, at a college, I teach a math course, and if I have a question about something, I pick up the phone and I call Michael, and it doesn't matter what time and night it is. And I say, okay, Michael, here's a good one for you, and we debate this particular question. So um, I think that there are some really, I think teachers have natural instincts about the subjects and passions. And I, to be honest with you, there are six people this year who are not teaching two subjects. In the entire middle school. And out of those six, four have taught two subjects within the time that I've been principal at the school. Only two have been, and those two are certified to teach a second subject. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't to say at all that the middle school is like. No, Julia, we're going to have to move okay, on. I'm sorry. sorry. We're just, we're so crunched for time. So if I ask if the, um, any board members, any other board members have questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, Go ahead, David. This is the first time tonight that we've heard anything on this seventh, eighth grade change from a junior high model to a middle school model. Is this something that has to happen now, or is this something that could go through a committee process where the high school gets to be involved, and there's some legitimate discussion around this, and the public can get involved? And um, quite frankly, that's one of my que that's my question. Is this something you that can? can go yeah. ahead. I don't see a man. I don't see probably the major shift that some people are envisioning is, oh, this, this is what's going to happen to the, to the middle school. Um, this is, uh, let's say, for instance, that this that, was. That's not my question, Steve. My question was, something that could is this something off? that could be put off and go through a committee process so that everybody can understand it and buy into it? Well, of so, course, the answer is yes. It can be put off, and, and it can go through a committee process. I was, I was talking with a parent a few weeks ago, and we were, it was in a conference. And I was dropping all these bombshells on her, and she she asked me, "Oh, teaming is that like a, is that a current trend in, in middle level education?" I said, "No, that that was a trend ten years ago." Yeah, I I, I, mean, I think widespread implementation um, could probably go back, like you know, I said, twenty years ago. A lot of the research that you see in front of you started in the mid nineteen eighties, the late nineties. Well, not to disagree with you too much, but... Okay, David, I'm going to ask if any other board members have questions before we get into to debate. Does anybody else have questions that they would like to ask? Okay. I have a question, uh, and I believe it's probably in process. When the team teaching piece went through this, and again, I haven't, first time I've seen it, did you go, did you check in with, I loved everything you stated. Wonderful, fabulous, I, t I totally believe with you. But as a school board member, I need to ask, have you checked in with wellness, just to throw wellness and guidance? Have you checked in with, um, have you checked in with our school and have you checked in with Jeff Shedd and Pong Cove to do this district-wide work? And that would be my only concern. I believe totally what you're doing, but my concern would be about the Big picture. I'm a in the moment girl. I, I'm there with you, but have you checked the big picture? Like I'm still at the language art girls, mm, yeah. you know, at the that night the and I can't get past that. So I just need to know, have you done It is a continuing conversation from the from Pond Cove to the middle school because at Pond Cove, Tom make make sure I get this right, this conversation uh, about uh, third grade, fourth grade, doing a similar teaming structure to fifth and sixth grade. Um, so it's a three, four, five, six, seven, eight conversation. And I've been sharing information about these kinds of things uh, with uh, Jeff and, and Alan and other, other administrative groups for the winter session. So any, what you're asking. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Does anybody else have questions? Okay, I have, a couple, I have a question. Steve, um, a while ago I heard you mention that you weren't sure um, if, if the team teaching approach was implemented, how many 7th, um, 8th grade teachers could do the math science 
and the ELA and social studies. And because one of the um, power, powerful arguments to be made for this is that you can make these um, connections between curriculum if you are, are teaching those two aspects. And um, I know that you had some questions as to how that actually would shift out. Are you talking? Yeah. OK, all right. Um, one of the primary focus that I'm going to be picking on this is like a humanities block, social studies and language arts, as much as I can to make sure that we arrange those subjects to be able to be taught by, so that if the student has this teacher for language arts, they also likely have that teacher for, for social studies so that there can be um, common experience and that when the kids are working on this paper and do you, do you have a sense of how many of our current staff c you could actually do that with if it's social studies and language arts yeah. and you stop by the board in my office you'll see that there are 12 people uh, seven seven and eight who are certified and can teach not just certified but can teach social studies and I think it's nine or ten that can teach and are certified and could actually teach language arts as well. I have far more in those numbers than I do, for instance, in science. Okay. Um, <clears throat> have you um, had um, a building, actually, it, it, this, I mean, really, this also includes Pond Cove. I don't know why we haven't heard from Pond Cove um, in regards to the team teaching, but let's just take middle school for, for right now. Have you had a conversation building wide with your teachers about this idea and if so what was the response from from the teachers um, yeah I, it's I mean from my perspective if I work at a middle school and I'm required to believe in that I don't need a presentation to convince me but I know I'm not I'm not going to force that on everyone but um, we did have a, a staff meeting to discuss the possibility I've talked with I don't know, 30 people that I work with 40 people I don't know how many people we have in the building but since that time, a couple months ago, maybe, um, and I, unless people are just sort of discussing one thing but feeling another, I haven't talked to one person out of those 30 or 40 people that thinks this is a bad idea, who disagrees with it, which isn't to say they don't have reservations and who aren't, you know, nervous. I mean, I'm nervous about going up to an, a different grade and changing things like that, but I think for the most part, the overwhelming sense is, is excitement that we're actually making a step in this direction. Again, I, you know, 30 to 40, I'm, I'm guessing, but I mean, two months worth of conversations with people from grades five, six, seven, and eight. Um, so, mm -hmm. okay. but it was presented to us. It, it's not something that we're going to go and say, oh, by the way, you're teaching eighth grade next year on a two person mm -hmm. team, and we're going to be like, what? So, okay. Does anybody else have questions? Yeah, I have one more. Okay. Um, I've heard at most some comments being made to Jeff Shedd. It seems to me that there is an integral part of what happens in middle school, and you may not like this, and that you're entitled to your opinion, but um, preparation people for high school. Have there been extensive, because this is a major change, has there been extensive discussions with high school people in terms of whether or not this is a vertically integrated concept? Uh, to be honest with you, no, there has Thank you. Um, as far as, here's some examples. You know, Steve, we're all short time. I, I, that's good okay. enough for me. Yep. Okay. Um, since there are no more questions, do board members want to, um, and I'll call on people if that's okay. <laughs> um, if you, the board members would like to share some of their thoughts. Okay. Brave one that you are. I know. Um, you guys will get used to me. I love the presentation. I need the. Uh, I like. I like checking in with 30, 40 people myself, and I never know if we're really on the same page or if we're distracted. I'd like to. I trust the pro the process. I trust the teachers, and if all the teachers like it, I like for the developmental reasons. I like it a lot. I'd like to see, to make sure that everyone is very comfortable with the two subjects and the team, um, not because it is the thrill of teaching and not because this is where we're going, and so I have to pick another subject. That would be my, um, my gut reaction, and it's, I believe the teaching is there, 
but I'd like to see the, um, have the, be part of the conversation or hear you um, share the, that piece in the conversation. Is that a question or? Is no, that's fine. Anybody else? Well, I can't tell from the looks of their faces or your well, paper. Generally, people like raise a finger or a hand or something that they'd like to speak. So I'm waiting to see some indication. David. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think this is way too little information for us to make such a major decision. I'm very troubled by the fact that high school was not brought into this. This is a major change. Um, I have read a lot of literature. I'm not an expert, but I've read a lot of literature, and there's a lot of dispute on this. And I have talked with high school teachers who have talked to me, and they're very concerned about that. I think given that there hasn't been discussions with the high school, given the fact that this is not essential to do now, and the public is, seems to be adamantly against this, I think this is something that should go through the committee process for a year, where the high school and the middle school get together and coordinate this. I'll feel a lot more comfortable about it when I see both of these groups coming to an agreement with a, with a coordinated plan. And therefore, I don't support it now until that takes place. Okay. Thank you, David. Anybody else? Kathy. Ditto to my comments from before. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Is that for brief? That's very brief. Thank you. Ditto from my comments before. Um, Mary Finger, thank you. Um, I really appreciated Adam's presentation and you know, believe that um, this is a developmentally responsive um, way of looking at education for particularly grade seven, eight is, is something that, that we should look at. Um, I understand David's concern and um, and I'm a little wary only in that we're just um, we're just coming off a, a communications um, and I'm the, the head of I'm the chair of communications on the board a communications um, faux pas with the ALA and it caused certainly a, a lot of um, ill will and and um, there was a lot of fear involved with it and I would hate to see a good idea like this start off on the wrong foot so my feeling would be if um, I, I don't feel like I need a year to to look at this but I, I would like to see it go through some sort of public vetting process where um, and we you know I'd like to talk about that as a board, um, how, how we could foresee this and talk with you, Steve, about timelines and um, how to pull the public into this, how to pull the high school into it, have a, maybe a workshop where um, more people could hear Adam's presentation um, and understand it. I, I find that um, so much of getting buy-in has to do with getting good communication about these things, and Adam, you presented a really nice um, plan um, for a lot of good reasons. So um, my concern isn't about the plan, but it's just about the process and about trying to have a process where we get um, buy-in so we can start um, with our, you know, we can hit the ground running when we get it started. Um, so however people decide to do that. But I do trust our educators, and, and I thank you for your work and um, for um, putting this together and for um, putting it forward. Thank you, Mary. John? Um, well, I would echo uh, Mary's sentiments, really, and, and, and <clears throat> I'm also impressed by the, the presentation as I was by the ALL, ALA presentation, but um, this is a, a community school and I, I, I feel that um, and, and maybe the board needs to take some responsibility for the, the um, for the, the maybe a, a leadership failure in terms of um, outlining a process by which um, the community can be brought along um, to understand these kinds of changes um, the, these both of these changes were, were introduced to us as part of a a budget process which has really absorbed uh, most of our attention for the last two months and uh, gave I think the board not enough time to um, and certainly the community as well not enough time to really understand um, 
what the thinking is behind this this sort of change. So um, I, I also think that the, the workshop format that, that that we use is a much more appropriate environment for um, the kind of presentation that you've given tonight. We're not sitting up here like judges um, in front of the room. We're all at the same table and we're talking about um, these ideas together. And, and um, um, so I would, I would look forward to that kind of opportunity to workshop um, this thinking too. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so um, I think the general feeling is that um, there's support for the concept, um, but that there's a desire to have a little bit additional time. Um, I know personally I'm very satisfied what I heard about middle school, but we've heard nothing about Pond Cove. Um, and Tom, I am sorry, but we're at 9.15, and I, while I would really love to hear what you're thinking about, I don't think we have... No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. He's got okay. a timeline. Okay. Great, Tom. So, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I think that what I'd like to suggest is that um, Steve and Alan and uh, maybe just Kathy and myself can just talk at some point about what would make sense for a process, and then I can get back to the whole board. Um, about the timeline, with the with the understanding that if, if we can achieve, if we can get through this in a fashion that would be su support what the school and the teachers would like to achieve for next year, at the same time of including the public and the school board in the discussion, um, I thought would be my goal as chair is to tr try to try to accomplish both things in in a timely fashion. Um, if it seems as if that's not achievable, then um, we'll have to talk about it as a board as to, as to how we handle it. But I think that we should try to aim for that. Um, and you need to go home to your new baby. So thank you so I much. Time, so when I was at work, yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Thank you very thank much. You, uh, Chairperson, can I add a po short postscript? You, thank you. You have 30 seconds. Versus, Go. Okay. I, I want to make it clear that I haven't made up my mind about whether or not this is a good idea or not. I do support our teachers. I do give them a presumption that they are right. What I am bothered by is process. I can't learn about something in one day and make a decision that affects that many kids. I think the workshop approach is correct. Um, and I, th I think that um, high school has to be involved. Okay, but I don't okay. want to indicate in any way, can I finish the sentence, please? Okay. In any way that I'm not supportive of the concept. I, I don't know. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, Thank you. Board goals update. It, it, I'm not going to say anything about this other than those are the goals that we. I was just, just going to ask if we might uh, table the discussion on the board goals until our next meeting due to the hour. We're, we're not going to discuss it right now, actually. It's just me talking about how we actually do have board goals um, and that I had asked the chairs of the various committees to come tonight to talk about where we are with those goals. And depending on what time it is, we can potentially um, postpone that. But that was the, the extent of it. 2010-2011 um, school calendar update, Alan. I think probably what I would suggest is the same thing. The calendar that you see in front of you is the format of the calendar we put together. Uh, there are some pieces on it that I should explain, but recognizing the tightness of our time, what, do I, what I would suggest is our plan was to put it on our website so that we can get re information returned. I did receive quite a few uh, pieces of information from teachers. I have talked with Dwight about a couple of items that we need to discuss that we were supposed to have an executive board meeting and didn't. But what I, what I might suggest, unless you want me to go through it step by step by step, is that I would put it on the website, put a description of some of the days, like for instance, August 27th, 30, 31st, and so on, and move it on from there, and give a month for return, and then bring it back to the board in May to take a look at it as a final piece. Yes. Thank you. 
So will the board get a chance to talk about it? Next and month. Next month. And then we vote on it in June? Or no, I, I would hope we could vote on it in May so that. So if we have questions in May, though, how can those be incorporated into ch potential changes? I, I guess what I would ask is, I, I have, I, it's, what is hard for me right now is because we're in such tight uh, situation. I mean, I am more than happy if you want to spend some time on it now, I can go through it. Uh, my concern is, I, I will tell you that next year I'm going to build a calendar in September, mm -hmm. get it over with. Uh, but it's, it, the baseline is uh, what I would see would happen is you get those questions, uh, be able to talk about them, and then discuss it in May. Okay. Uh, and hopefully you could vote on it at the same time. Or maybe I can send questions yep. to you Definitely. between now and then. Definitely. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Boiler? I'm going to do probably the same type of thing. Uh, we had talked the last time about the boilers for the high school. Uh, you gave me uh, indication to at least take a look at an engineering firm to come in and take a look at the boilers. Uh, what we have done is we do have an engineering firm who we have not hired yet, but had that engineering firm come in to explain to us what they will be doing. Uh, what, it, what it looks like right now, what we have is we have discovered we do have some pretty heavy-duty asbestos removal on the boilers at the high school, which will probably amount to about $12,000. Uh, we are finding that be the, because of the economy, the price of the boilers, which I think originally we talked about was about $350,000, is probably going to be down to two hundred seventy-five dollars or less, and that's economy-wise currently right now. And so we, have, we are looking at an approximate cost of $300,000 as opposed to about $400,000. Uh, David had asked the last time, and, I, and so I, I did get this information to be sure I had it accurate, is that David had asked if one of the boilers go down, can the other boiler pick up the work? Mm -hmm. My understanding as of today, and this meeting was just held this afternoon, my understanding as of today, as we are right now, both boilers are 40 years old, but at this point in time, it is hoped that if one went down, the other could last if we don't get this done this year. The other piece to it is if one boiler goes down and the other, then the other one breaks down, we can do uh, some uh, portable boilers, which would be more expensive, but it could be done. Uh, or we could retube one of the boilers, and that is about thir $30,000 plus in order to do that. So those were some of the pieces we looked at. What, we, what, we, what I do have is the fact that we know from the report that we got earlier that I think I brought to you when the uh, Conservation Committee was looking at it, these boilers are oversized and they are extremely inefficient. They're 40 years old. Uh, they talked to me about today the best time to replace, if you're going to replace, is in the summertime. Uh, however, I'll go back again, and I think David and I had this conversation also. It does not mean that the work that would be done on putting new boilers in will disrupt classrooms. However, the noise of the process and some of the uh, exhaust that comes from it would mean we really should do it during a summer time as opposed to a school, school year, if at all possible. The timeline they talked about was three weeks for the engineering work, two weeks for bidding, six weeks ordering the boilers. I, I would say to you too, I know a lot of you are taking notes, I will send this out to you tomorrow. This is the very last minute, so I just got it just before I came down, so I will send this to you. Uh, so the, the total work would be 11 weeks to do the construction from engineering to asbestos removal to get the boilers in place. Uh, and the asbestos removal uh, would need to happen after June 17th, just again because of students in the building. Uh, if we replace this summer, oh, this is the answer I, I just gave. This, if we don't replace this summer, we, ha we could run the possibility of losing both boilers but it doesn't mean necessarily that we will. Uh, challenges that will come with this is the timeline I just talked about, it is also the funding. Uh, we have talked with Mike. What I'm understanding is that the Energy Committee has a report that is going to the Town Council sometime before the end of this month. And the first item on their energy proposal is the boilers at the high school. Uh, one of the issues that Mike has talked about is the fact we also know that natural gas is coming to Cape Elizabeth. Uh, uh, Northern Utilities has not set a final date yet. His hope is that they will be moving fairly rapidly because he would really like to see a bond that would cover both the boilers and the Northern Utility bill. 
And so we, we have had that conversation. Nothing final is with it, and it really needs to go to the town council to take a look at the proposal and see how it works. What are the positives of this? It is an energy saver, obviously. I mean, boilers that are 40 years younger than what we've got now it will be an energy saver. Uh, our contractor pricing will be much lower as we care for the boilers, and the bond rates right now are very low. So those are pieces that we will be looking at. From my perspective, again, as I said, uh, four of us met with an engineer today. So, I mean, this is fairly fresh information. Uh, so what will happen is uh, that that person will be coming back. We do need to look at bidding and how we're going to do that. But I am rather, rather leaning towards not doing it this summer because of the tightness of everything that's coming along and hoping, like David and I talked about, that that second boiler, if we lose one, will help us. Uh, but they did say it is possible to get portable boiler, which will be more expensive, but could get us through if we really had a problem. And so if we lose the furnace at zero degree uh, colder weather, uh, that we would be able to get something in there fairly quickly to do that job. So that's kind of the quick overview of what we got today. Uh, it was a really good chance to ask a lot of questions, and I was remembering questions that each of you has asked me to try to be sure I had those answers. I will put this on uh, e email tomorrow morning, so you will have this. This is also very quick, just a summary of what we did talk about today. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Could I ask one quick question? Sure. Um, I, I would rely on you and the engineers to tell us whether we should do it this summer or not. I think it's fairly clear when you run the new numbers that this is actually cash positive. We'll make, it's weird to say that, but we'll save a lot of money, greater than the cost of the boiler, one. And I would suggest that you talk to Mike about if we can't actually get the boiler in the summer, we get the bond issue, so we lock in the lower rates, so when we do put it in, we're in better shape. Yeah. And that was, uh, uh, to be honest with you, David, that was a little part of the conversation. I didn't see David, I uh, mean Michael today, because I had so many meetings. Pauline did talk with him. He is still here tomorrow, and so I wanted to present this to you tonight, and I'll go back to Michael tomorrow just to check and see where we are at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to new business consideration um, to adopt the 2010-2011 budget. Kathy, would you like to provide a quick um, overview? Sure. Um, we all received from Pauline via email, I think, and it must be on the website too, um, the papers, and I don't know if anybody, uh, uh, the update, excuse me, the revised 4610 draft update. Um, do you? I'm going to have to move that around. Do you, um, does anybody need a copy of that? Yes? Yeah. I'll take one. Um, Pardon? Is there any available for the audience? Or is it just the... I think we ran 12, so there should be some. Yep. There may be some. When they get to the end, if there's extras, you could maybe set them on the edges if anybody else wants to see those. Um, so I'm just going to go down and briefly give an overview. Um, first of all, what we're working with through our five um, workshops was the midpoint budget and adjustments to that. Um, historically, Alan, the board had asked Alan to put together three budgets, one with a 0% tax increase, one with a two-something. Maintenance budget. 2.75 budget About. increase, and one with a five-point something. Yes. A maintenance budget. Yeah. I bought. Right, but I, I just want to say what the, the percentages are. So when the board start, got together and started working on their workshops for the five workshops, what we ended up doing was taking the 2.75 budget and making adjustments based on conversations, um, presentations, a whole bunch of things. So the budget that we're that we have in front of us is the midpoint budget with the March 25th and April 5th adjustments. The total expenditure budget um, for that is a 3.36% increase. Um, the total revenues are 3.36. And the mills raise for education is a 2.75% increase. <coughs> 
So if you're looking at the median home value, which is um, the, the town has listed as $253,800, the increase to the taxes for that home at 2.75 would be $87.56 per year. So um, I will go over briefly the changes to that 2.75 budget that the board suggested be added in, and I say suggested because we haven't voted. Um, yes, yeah, suggested taken in and taken out, thank you. Um, first of all, starting with Pond Cove, we suggested putting in, back in the guidance, excuse me, not putting back in, putting in a guidance counselor. No? No, no I was putting in a um, guidance, I'm sorry, you, yes. that's what you just said, right. I'm so sorry. That's okay, <laughs> that's okay. Um, also at Pond Cove, we suggested putting in an EdTech 2 in the computer lab. We suggested an EdTech 1 in the library media center of a half position. We suggested a half position librarian. We um, reduced the EdTech 3 in the library media center. And uh, the EdTech 3 to EdTech 2 to EdTech 3 tech integrator was a reduction um, picked up by the other piece. In the high school, we added back in the Achievement Center teacher, one, um, a full-time position. We, um, <coughs> sorry, I don't have a ruler in front of me. We added back in a 0.2% math teacher. We added back in a 0.1% theater position. We added back in a full-time administrative support personnel for attendance. We subtracted out a half-time teacher executive skills. Mandarin. Did I miss it? Yeah. There's one more. You missed uh, the reduction of the Mandarin teacher. We didn't change that in the 2.75 budget. It was already out from right. the no, zero percent. It was in. It was, it was in, and we removed it. Oh, it that's did. Why, that's why you we see did. a yellow line there with no number. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Sure. Um, and then the co-curricular stipend mock trial, um, we added back in the 3,000. And then for the district ride position, we added back in a one, posi one full-time position for administrative support in the health office. Did I miss any position pieces that we agreed to that were in there? I don't think so. Just one clarification. We added back in the, I love fractions of human beings, the half a librarian. Does that mean we now have a full-time librarian at Pond Cole? Just so people understand that, that yes. they were cutting the position to a half, we made it a full. Yeah, that's right. And, but at middle school, you still have a half. Correct. I just, when, when you say we added back in a half, it sounds like we have half-time teacher. So, but I wanted people to know that that was a full-time librarian. Thank you. Thank you. Mary? Um, I did see that um, you have a line item here for teachers and administrators salaries donation, but we don't have anything for um, a parking fee. That's, That's in the revenue. That's okay. If you go to the, um, if you go to this page, you'll see it appear as revenue. Okay. Okay. Kathy, are you, are you going to go over the contingency, the, the rest of the, Items at the bottom? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Then we, under contingency, we have subtracted out $142,396. We have subtracted out $42,000 in legal fees. We have subtracted out the teacher and administrator's salary donation of $25,000. Um, so the total addition to the budget of 2.75, which was the midpoint budget, we have added back in $472,026. Have I missed anything, <coughs> board? No? Okay. So um, I think that that 
covers the changes. Um, so I thump, fumbled through my papers. I think that covers the changes that we had talked about, um, that the board had talked about in our workshops. Did anybody want Alan? The only thing that I would add to this, because it, using this document is a little difficult to remember what is already there. And one of the things you did do at Pond Cove is you added a uh, guidance counselor, but you also kept a social worker for a regular education. But that isn't figured in here because it was already in the budget, just, just so that people understand that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there any others that people want to mention that, were, that was in the 0% budget that? No? In, OK. Can you just explain how that, so everyone understands how that, because it sounds like you, we took the midpoint budget, which you described as two point. Seven, five Seven, initially. Five and then yeah. added to it. And I just, can you explain what the net, the taxes impact is of the budget that we're discussing? Because it's not 2.5%, mm -hmm. it's one. or higher, it's actually much less than that. That'll be here. Oh, um, thank you. The other piece of paper. Okay, so if you look at the performer, and this assumes that the town council is, is adopting the budget and then they have not adopted their budget. This is assuming that the budget presented by the town manager will be in place. Um, for expenditures, the school department's um, expenditures would be $20,676,971 or an increase of $671,885 or a 3.4% increase. For revenues, um, the school department's revenues would be $3,346,636 or an increase over the prior year of $87,554 or 2.7% increase. So the net to taxes um, for the school for our fiscal year 2010-2011 budget would be $17,330,335 or an increase of $584,331 or 3.5% increase. And when you go to the tax rates um, for the school department, we would be moving from $12.54 per thousand to $12.89 per thousand, or an increase of 35 cents per thousand, or a 2.8% increase. Is that what you're, and, and so the median home um, affected would be um, a 1.7% increase, or an increase of $77.23 for the median home. That's for the total tax rates. Right. That's including town, county, school, community services. Um, the net to tax would be 1.7% um, for the median home. Right. And just for clarification, that's what the tax rate will go up. Your taxes will go up by, if, if. all these assumptions are, will go up by 1.7% or $77.23 for the, your tax bill for the medium home would go up by that. Actually, I think the percent is, well, that's correct for the medium home. Right. Questions? Okay. All right. Um, could Do you? We, I'm sorry. sorry. Did, okay. Go ahead. Um, okay. So I would ask: Do um, school board members have any last questions for administrators? Around. Okay, John. Um, I have a question about the uh, proposed reduction of a 0.5 middle school librarian. Uh, I believe that the, we have a librarian who's retiring. Yes, sir. And so is the savings, um, if we were to um, reintroduce a, a, a full-time librarian as opposed to a half-time librarian as a replacement for the retiring teacher, would the savings or, or would the cost of that actually be half of the, sa of the salary of the current librarian, or would the cost be less than that because we would likely be hiring somebody with fewer years of experience in our school system and, and a 
lower salary. It would likely be less than that. Did, can it, can we get an, an estimate of what that? I would check with Pauline. Would I don't know if she's got those documents right there with her or not for the middle school librarian. Pauline, the current librarian, how many years was the librarian employed? I believe top of the scale. Top of the scale. And we would be bringing somebody in at the bottom of the scale, correct? Okay. And um, does um, Hayden... I, I understand. Does, does Hayden have um, bachelor's, master's, PhD? Master's. Master's? Okay. And is that part of the job description to have a master's? Uh, in library science. Yeah, was, Come on, Linda. Don't take my book with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Master's in library science. Master's in library science would be, would be required for that, for that job. So we're basically just talking about an expense um, difference between the zero step and the 30 step. I can't remember what it is. I understand. Okay. Could I ask a question to simplify this so I understand it? What I think, John, is what you're asking that in order to get a full time librarian with the retirement, the net change, if we didn't replace retiring teacher but added a half time librarian, is, is about the same and maybe even still a slight savings? Pauline is saying no. She's saying that that's not necessarily the case, that the, the amount of money that we may end up having to pay to replace the current librarian with another full-time librarian would perhaps be about um, equal because of changes to the benefits package, yeah, right. if I'm understanding her correctly. I believe that Mr. Atwood's benefit package is not as expensive as perhaps somebody else who would come in. Okay, so that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for administrators? I do. Okay. I believe this is for Tom and Steve, um, not for Jeff. And it has to do with RTI. My, my thinking is what I'm hearing from Tom's narrative and, well, I'll wait, just let me do Tom's because I'm not sure. Um, what I've heard from your narrative, Tom, was that you need more teacher collaboration time and the teacher, you need more teacher collaboration time. There's not enough time for the teachers uh, to work for students, to assess, meet the needs of the students and uh, help those uh, students move forward. I was looking at this and I believe if you had an EdTech 3 in the building with a loss of a literacy person, that that would cover that t collaboration time for your teachers to be able to uh, facilitate or to work under the new RTI plan that is due July 10th that we're already working on. That's why I'm looking at Dom because I, um, and my follow through with that. So, Kate, you need, no, you need to just okay, so there. Um, your, do you need your, your question's getting so long that I think we're, um, we're getting lost. Your, your question to Tom is, would a Tech 3 provide teachers with time to, to deal with RTI? Is that necessary? We have an EdTech 3 now that we're currently using for that, but it's not, it's not widespread. Right. She certainly helps. I don't know if you're asking if we want another one. I'm asking if you'd like, is. I am asking if you'd like another one with the RTI coming in. Yes. Because, <laughs> because it would then, and because this is, I'm a process girl, because this then leads to less identification if we have a proper R RTI model, which we have and we've already initiated, then I would believe that RTI needs more work since we're mandated and we would have less 
assessment issues in third and fourth grade when national testing comes it, it, out? It's just, yes, uh, RTI would be affected, but just generally more collaborat collaboration time is needed for everything we've heard tonight about teaming and curriculum. And I believe you could do that, but the position, you could, I could add it in, but being that the or have a tax issue, I would think that losing a literacy person may be that balance. I Do you want piece. to speak to that, Dominic, or? I can just add to how Okay. Um, the governor just passed the new Maine special education law today, so all those changes that were that um, David you were talking about have gone through, and there's lots of different changes with the RTI. They have shifted and made it even more ambiguous and more um, difficult to understand. So to answer your question, I, I think Alan's in the process of looking at whether it's reading, math, or writing, or behavior. I think we need to really look at what these this language is, and then and then look at our resources and then kind of shift. I think we're going to need to make some shifts anyway. So, and I think you've already have some um, groups that you're going to be working on in the near future. So I just think that's real Thank important. You, so that might help you shift Thanks. your. Yeah. Thanks for that good news. <laughs> really, just always full of good news. So Tom, my question was, um, will we need, I'm sorry, I have to answer, I have to like. I think he said yes. Yes, okay, fine. Okay. But with so, that answer, he would say yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Kate, you're you're not you're talking about subtracting a position to add a position, correct? I assume that one ed tech three would be able to affect every classroom in Pond Co or K through two and then if you have another one. And whereas one literacy person would be affecting a, a smaller amount of children because we also have two other literacy people in the building. Okay. Okay. Any, and you know, folks, we've had five workshops, so um, you know, I invited questions with the hope that there wouldn't be a gazillion. Um, so I will quietly ask again: Does anybody have any more questions? Was that an intimidating statement? Who would dare? Good. Okay. Um, I will, is there somebody who would like to make a motion? Anybody? I'd like to make a motion, but I need to have a document to describe, I mean. Okay, I, so let me just say, well, to say that um, we're required to say, um, a particular phraseology. So um, once somebody commits to making a motion, I will pass you the verbiage. Which includes, which includes the ARRA money. Which okay, is there you go. Brave man. Now, I, the, so what I would say is that um, if you want to say something in addition to that, that I think it's fine. We can amend. You can amend I can amend my motion, right? After yes. I make it. Beliefs. Yes, you can. We're going to see. And I'm going to watch Pauline very carefully as to how much she grimaces. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, the, so I just want to make sure that I understand what number goes in the. I said, I said I'd make the motion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I move to approve the 2010-2011 school budget in the amount of twenty million six hundred and seventy-six thousand nine hundred and seventy-one dollars, which includes nine hundred and twenty-five thousand one hundred and seventy in federal ARRA stabilization funds. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Mary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Discussion. Well, I, I just have a little question on procedure. We just approved the gross amount, but I assume we're also approving these specific changes that were the laundry yes. list. Yes. And, and therefore, the motion is to approve an amount plus whatever you want. Uh, 
midpoint budget as adjusted as of, as modified as of 4-5-2010. Um, Pauline, can we make that amendment to the motion and have it still be considered legal? <laughs> I, I think you just need to have a dollar amount. Yeah. Right. As long as you mention the uh, RF stabilization. We're fine. Okay. Okay. So is that an amendment you would like to make? Yes, yeah, so we know how we're going to. Okay. Is there a second to that amendment? Second. Okay, Mary, thank you. And do you, and so, great. Uh, further discussion? Okay, I'd like to make an amendment. Um, I would like to, um, don't kill me. I would like to uh, amend it to change the changes i'm sorry for being so inarticulate um but i would like to add back in a half-time middle school librarian and reduce no sorry maintain all the technology integrators at edtech 2. so that's a savings of five thousand and it's an increase of um Sorry, give me a second here. 37612. Mm -hmm. 37612, and I would like to take the balance of those two amounts um, from contingency. So there's a, a zero impact on taxes. I second that. Okay, now uh, if I may just explain um, what I'm thinking is that um, in Pond Cove we have what we call a media center, um, and I would encourage the middle school to follow suit and try to incorporate some of the computer lab work because um, I believe that's right next to the library um, and utilize that additional librarian try to incorporate some of the librarians work with more of the computer work um, as, as part of the um, research modern Day research, but of course that ultimately rests with the administration and the librarian. But that would be my hope. So, what's the net of the two items? You said one was down, taking away five thousand, and the other one was adding in what? 30, it's actually no. It, I apologize. It's a more than five thousand. It's forty-two five hundred. That's eight thousand five hundred from thirty-seven six one two. Elaine, do you have your little calculator going? Twenty-four thousand eight hundred. Thank you. So it's an increase, but you're suggesting to take it from contingency. So you're yeah. changing the contingency number from 142,396 up by another 24,862? Correct. OK, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, you mean the amount we're taking from contingency, not yes. the amount of right. the contingency? Yes. OK. Yeah. Any further discussion? Could, could I just ask, since I'm not a math whiz, I was not accelerated math, um, what do we have now in the, spe we'll call it special contingency, not the normal contingency of 70, but the special contingency for next year's cliff? <laughs> a rough number for the public? Um, it was 400,000 less 70,000. That was 330,000 less 24,000. So it's roughly 300,000, a little bit over. In the purpose of that, just for the purpose of, that's the one thing I was going to ask. The public should understand that that is the reason for that is, and we're not a, applying it to the tax rate. Is next year we lose our stimulus money of nine hundred thousand dollars, and we better be prepared for that. So I just want to add that. Any further discussion, Kathy? This is our time to say what we want to say for the sure, year, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm a little concerned by a few things, and I am still concerned about taxpayers um, in town who are living on fixed incomes and still hurting from the recession. This is my seventh budget. I can't believe it's been that long, but anyway. Um, and I have been concerned about that all along, and I continue to be concerned about it. Um, a couple things that 
bother me as well. We talk about being worried about asking parents to pay more and more fees. What I hear us saying when we say that is we're asking the taxpayers as a whole to pay more and more fees. I am not as concerned about asking parents to pay fees because I consider them user fees. If their children want to do things, then um, that's something that they can either decide to do or not to do. Um, so when we say uh, we can't ask parents to pay any more fees, I hear us saying we can ask the entire taxpayer base to pay those fees because it's one or the other. Um, I am. I continue to be concerned about the $8,000 parking fee that we've added into the budget for the high school. I don't think that that's something that's going to work very well. And the reason I don't is because I think it will end up being um, on the backs of the administrators to police. I think that you may have parents that oppose $50 a year parking fees, maybe not. But I don't see that the police, right, right now, it's not agreed upon by the town to um, administer those. And I think that we're including the 8,000 in the budget, but I don't think we will in actually see that 8,000. Um, as David mentioned, I'm very concerned about the ARRA money. Part of me is concerned that if we don't take some hits this year, we are going to take bigger hits next year. Um, we have a huge uh, deficit that we're going to be looking at next year, assuming that the ARA money is gone. Um, so I, part of me is balancing the do we try to maintain what we have this year or do we start to look at um, reducing that this year so that the hit we take next year isn't quite as big. Um, uh, Alan has mentioned the boiler replacement and I personally feel that we should do that as soon as possible. Um, I'm hoping that that bond money comes in but um, I am concerned about the amount of money that we are taking out of contingency. Um, I think that if we left some of that money, more of that money in contingency, we would have a cushion for next year. I use the word cushion. I don't mean it to sound like we're stowing money away, but we would have something to fall back on next year in case our, our, um, our funding next year is in the millions of dollars less because I think it's going to be at least a million dollars. It could be more. So um, I always come back to that Cape Elizabeth is a public school. I, my sense is that some people think it's a private school, and it's not. It's a school here for all the students, um, which brings me back to my comments of earlier that I think that some parents feel that it is a school only for their children, and it's not. Um, and as a board member, I feel that it's important to look out for every student in the system, not just some to the exclusion of others. Uh, I know that we still have reading recovery in the budget, and I would like to see, as an individual board member, uh, a committee put together after the budget season uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with reading recovery, but what I am saying is it's an expensive program. And I'd like to see us look at some alternative programs. Maybe we move to one, maybe we don't. But I'd like to see a committee put together of people who are interested, who are knowledgeable, to take a real hard look at reading recovery as to whether that is the program that best suits um, our students or if there's something else that suits it as well and might be a little bit less expensive. Um, so that's sort of the things that I wanted to talk about. I don't necessarily agree with everything that's in the budget, but I don't need to. Um, I think that it's important that we compromise. There is no budget that I've voted on so far that has made everybody happy. <laughs> um, the first budget we had, my first year, I voted against it. Um, but, and we know that we hear from a lot of um, people in town we hear from people that say it's too small, um, it's too large, and everything in between. And I feel um, very 
responsible and honored to be able to be somebody who gets to vote on that. So that's all. Thank you. Kathy. Would anybody else like to say something? Ms. Mary? We, we say how we're going yes. to vote? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, how you're feeling. How I feel? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, how, how I feel, feel is how I, I'm, I'm going to vote. Um, I actually support the work that we've done um, working from the midpoint and, um, and with the amended changes. Um, and I think we've done good work, and I want to thank the superintendent for all of the hours that he's put in along with the DLT. Um, I wrote some comments down. Is it all right if I read those now, sure. Rebecca? Um, I think that the board has really done its best to explore all of the suggested cuts and to build a budget from midpoint that was responsive to the desires of all the stakeholders in the town. Um, in more than 15 hours of public meeting on this budget, we learned a great deal from our administrators and our parents and our staff um, and our students, both current and past. We had students weighing in from um, years ago about different programs. Um, and we learned about what they value in our schools. Um, we found out that every cut hurts um, and that our schools are lean. They're lean enough for some and they're too lean for other people. Um, it is, I am comfortable that when cuts have been possible, for instance, when class thresholds have gotten to a certain point that we can cut a teacher um, or move a teacher elsewhere, that has happened. Um, we're certainly no stranger to lean budget cycles, and as such, over the years, we have lost many valued programs, um, and unlike many of our counterparts, we have not had equal opportunities for educational improvement. For instance, CAPE students don't have um, access to the one-on-one -on -one computing in um, high school that some schools do. Um, many classes still rely on aging textbooks um, despite the targeted parental fundraising that was done last year for the middle school. Um, and our professional development funds for our teachers have been cut by almost two-thirds in the last five years. Um, so. In the past, when programs have been on the line, I think parents have stepped up quietly to save them by paying additional fees or assuming responsibilities. Um, and the message that we have heard actually over and over again in our public meetings and over the emails have been um, that our schools are not at the tipping point, they are past the tipping point and that more cuts in programs and services would only further damage an already compromised ability to be competitive. Um, but given the economic climate, some cuts were necessary. And I believe the board has cho chosen a prudent path this year. Um, not only does the budget continue to provide, this budget with amendments, continue to provide um, some key services and programmings to our students without dismantling some of our prized educational foundations, but it also looks towards future preservation. Um, the board has chosen, as we mentioned before, to set aside uh, about $300,000 to prepare for next year's um, projected shortfall. Um, this is a fraction of the $2 million that the town sets aside in contingency for emergencies. Uh, the reservation of these funds, I think, is proactive and responsible. Um, and now, I feel like there can be no doubt that Cape Elizabeth, all, all people in Cape Elizabeth love the schools and they value education. So it's no surprise that this budget's a community effort. Teachers are participating in this budget by offering up to a day's pay, um, dependent, and that's dependent on the median homeowner's tax increase. Parents will again face um, increased athletic fees um, at the high school. And students will be paying $50 a year to park in the high school lot versus $25 for a four-year pass. In addition, this budget will include a very modest tax increase to homeowners. In short, um, after hours of discussion and study, I believe this to be a responsible budget for our schools and our students and one that I think we can all feel good about delivering to the town council on May 6th and subsequently to the voters on June 8th. 
And um, in closing, again, I would like to thank Alan and the remarkable team of district leaders for their work and for their patience. Um, we spent a lot of time on this. Um, and I'd like to commend this board for the hours that they've spent looking at each potential cut and weighing each potential outcome. I think it's been a very productive exercise. Um, and mostly I'd like to thank the public for really coming out in force this year and voicing their overwhelming support for a budget that maintains the educational standards um, that we need to produce successful 21st century learners um, and for being willing um, over and over again to actively participate in that continued investment. So I'm proud to be a member of this community and this board and to support this um, budget for our citizens. Thank you, Mary. Anybody else like to speak? David? Um, I'm not sure, even though I'm a trained trial lawyer, I'm not sure I can do better than Mary. That was an excellent speech, Mary. Um, I think it's important for the people to understand the process we did this year versus other years. I've heard a lot of complaints in the past about um, we just pick fig figures out of, of the air. We, we don't really zero budget. We don't really look at every crevice. It's simply not true this year. We had, we had three scenarios. One, no tax increase. One, which, which was called the midpoint. One was uh, basically a maintenance that, uh, budget where we kept programs and teachers but didn't add a thing. So we started off with a framework which was basically um, no improvements and potentially devastating cuts. We actually rejected the zero tax increase budget because it was devastating. We all agree that it would just devastate our schools. Um, I even had a list of things that I thought would use, that Alan produced, that I thought would, we'd finally catch up with Yarmouth, Cumberland, and uh, uh, Yarmouth, Cumberland, and Falmouth. And we rejected that as the taxpayers couldn't do it. So we focused between, believe it or not, the midpoint in a maintenance budget. The maintenance budget was just keeping our schools the same. And we settled somewhere in between there. So when people talk about this, you have to understand, we are actually cutting what a, for a maintenance budget about $300,000. So this is a austere budget. And we looked through, as the district team leaders will tell you, we went through this line by excruciating line. We went made every district leader justify on a cost-benefit analysis every single addition or subtraction from each one of these scenarios. I can't think of a more detailed review of a budget in the 30-odd cases I've done in bankruptcy than we've done on this budget. There is no fat. There is no waste. We'll turn over every stone, in fact, every grain of sand. There isn't. This is, this is an, um, quite frankly, I would have wanted to, to I was of the view that we should have a much larger tax increase. This town can afford it, but I, I tried to balance. I, compromise is, is what's good, and we are right now at a 1.7% net tax increase of about $77. I consider that eminently affordable by anybody in this town. And that allows us not to progress, to catch up, but to, but to come close to maintaining what we have now. I think Mary put it well. We, we've passed a tipping point. We're, we're in the bone, we're, it, it, whatever metaphor you want. And this was a compromise. The bottom line is, I really think the schools need more. But I know we can't, take, we can't afford to spend any less than what we're doing now. Thank you. Thank you, David. Anybody else? I'll wait. <clears throat> Wait a moment. Okay. Um, well, I, I don't think I can do better than Mary did either. I, I will support. Uh, what about me? <laughs> or, or better than David. Nobody can do better than. Boy, David. what a weak ego I have, huh? <laughs> um, I would just reiterate that this um, process has been um, very um, laborious and detailed. Um, and that it is not without um, its painful cuts. We're, we're losing two um, teacher support ed tech um, uh, people in Pond Cove. Um, we're losing two in the middle school, um, as well as an administrative support uh, person in the middle school. 
we were cutting a choral music um, teacher and a Mandarin teacher in the high school, um, a program that was began, uh, begun just a year ago um, and appeared to be showing signs of, of success. Um, we're cutting department head stipends in the high school, um, various uh, uh, cuts associated with athletics, um, official fees, a diving coach. Um, there are deep, um, there are deep, deep cuts in this budget. Um, a, 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 sorry, in, in instructional support, um, a full ed tech too. So um, there's um, significant cuts in this budget, and, and I think the process um, has been thorough, but it's not without um, its pain. Um, however, I think that um, the administration and the, and the board has done the best it, it, it can do to um, produce a budget that um, reflects uh, the need to be sensitive to the concerns that Kathy um, articulates very well um, in terms of um, the, the, the cost to the, to the taxpayer um, and um, at the same time um, preserves the, uh, the, the quality of the education in the schools. Thank you, John. Thank you. Who's going to blink first? I talk a lot. You know, if you don't feel like saying anything, that's, that's also fine. I and mean, I just want to make sure that you have an opportunity to speak if you want to. Well, I too do share a lot of the concerns that Kathy so eloquently um, expressed earlier this evening. As a matter of fact, as she was going through her list of items, I had a lot of similar items on my list as well. Um, I am very concerned with, you know, any increases that we're looking at to the bottom line taxpayer increase. Uh, last couple of years have been difficult years for us. I think this past year has probably been the most challenging year when it's come to looking at our budget. Um, from my perspective, I found it e an even bigger challenge this year trying to look at a three-budget scenario and trying to do the additions and the subtractions from a three-budget scenario. Um, I have always looked to the experts in the field as far as where we're at, where we want to go, and what is in the best interest of the kids. I do look for that guidance from our administrators, from Alan, and I, I felt this year um, I lacked a little bit of that information because it was more of a, a specific, a topic-specific conversation during some of our workshops. There was a lot of good conversation. I'm not saying it wasn't a good conversation, but sometimes it did become a, a bit frustrating, sometimes a bit lengthy, as demonstrated by tonight. So I will keep my comments uh, short. However, I too believe that the parking fees are unreasonable um, to be looking as a, as a revenue source at this, at this point in time. I do support some of the increased uh, fees to the athletic programs in the high school. Um, these are choices that people do have to make. And there are a lot of people out there making very difficult choices, more difficult choices than if their children get to participate in some of these extracurricular activities, unfortunately. Um, and I believe if, if it comes down to a choice between someone being able to stay in their home, pay their taxes, pay their lights, pay for their heating in their homes, that's a much more difficult choice than rather um, their student gets to participate in more than one fee. So I am very concerned about how any increases in our taxes at this point in time are going to affect every individual in this community, a community that has supported the schools for literally hundreds of years. And there are several um, folks in this community working, living off fixed income at this point in time that are continuing to support our schools. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Well, you all say it very, very well. And um, Evan, is that is it Evan there? No. Adam. Adam. Adam, Adam Kilm. Thank you. Adam uh, Kilm said it beautifully in his team teaching. I think of team teaching as I, I love the idea. But I, when I came onto the school board, I thought team teaching as parents. Uh, administrators, 
falling asleep? Parents, administrators, <laughs> and uh, school board working together and with the town working together to do the best for our children. And our children being the same as our, um, the families in our community that are having a hard time with paying their bills. So I see the families paying our bills and our students as equal weight. And it's our, all of our jobs to make it right for both. And that's why I'm not done yet. That's why I still want to like, I had like four more things I wanted to write Rebecca. <laughs> and Rebecca's, um, I have about four more things that I'd like to work on. One is I agree with Kathy that I, I'm user fees, we are parents and I could stop getting coffee and pay more user fees for the school. But that's my choice with my children. Um, and as well as the parking, I actually, I heard the administration, uh, the uh, vice principal, that it's going to be a nightmare. And I respect that it probably is going to be very difficult if we can't collect um, lunch program money that's been owed. I don't think we're going to be able to collect um, high school issues. I, I do still want the dog, so that's a whole nother. <laughs> Um, issue. But I believe we've done a wonderful job as a community and Alan gave me permission once, remember I was asking all the questions and I still ask all the questions, to ask the questions because the team, the administrative team does a very nice job answering and has to stand up for their answers and to the lead teachers who do a fabulous job and it's okay to ask them the hard questions because there is um, we believe that they'll have the answers for us. So I, I think we've done that throughout, and I think we've heard all the emails I've read from the uh, community were very, their tone was very con kind. Um, ELA was hard, ELA was very hard for me, but it, not the decision, the process. Um, but the tone from parents was very, very, nice to hear that feedback so I would encourage us to do that I look forward to the town council taking the this this budget if we vote on it so that we have will represent the children and then the town council can represent the community who um, and then I hope we'll be one district and we'll live happily ever after <laughs> thank you so I accept the budget thank you Kate does anybody else have any other comments they want to make? Okay, um, I'll just make a few because we're really getting late and um, everyone has done such a great job. Um, for me, this started, um, well, for this particular budget season, um, I kind of had started the, the curtailment workshop where we heard from the numerous citizens from all parts of our community um, basically say that they were looking for um, a reasonable, balanced approach to our um, town services and to our school district. And I think that um, many months later, many hours later, we have something that um, we can say is reflective of that. Our teachers have stepped up. Um, we are um, increasing non-tax revenues through parking fees and increased participation fees. And we are also asking taxpayers to pay a um, moderate increase. Um, so while it's still painful to think about the cuts that are going to be made this year, um, I think it's uh, a balanced um, approach. And, you know, if we, we did get um, additional revenues this year that we did not expect from the state, and we could have easily have taken that money and applied it to tax relief, or applied it to maintaining um, programs, but we really are very cognizant of what is coming next year. Um, and the initial indication from the state um, without taking in account enrollment changes is that our decrease will be around $600,000. Um, I suspect it will be more, but frankly when I saw that I was pleased that it wasn't 900 or a million dollars. Um, so I think by putting some funds aside in contingency to help address that um, revenue drop, 
um, will be in a slightly better shape than if we had just applied it to our programs or applied, applied it to immediate taxpayer relief. Um, this is my last budget for the school district, and I really had hoped and wished every year to have um, been able to do what's right for the schools and the teachers and the children. But the economic forces conspire against us year after year, as do the political forces, whether it be Tabor or Pulaski or consolidation laws or mandates um, or executive decrees to change special education laws. Um, we are buffeted year after year. Um, and I really commend the board and the teachers and administrators for working so hard to try to keep our district excellent and strong. So I will be supporting this budget. Okay, so we have a motion on the table. Is there any additional discussion? Could you reread the motion since there were quite a few amendments <clears throat> in <that> place? <laughs> the initial motion was a consideration to, uh, to an action to adopt the superintendent's 2010-11 budget, and you gave it to us with the totals on it, minus the uh, ARRA money, mm -hmm. if I'm not correct. That was by John and Mary. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where I am stuck, and so I need a little help yet. There was an interim one by David and Mary, uh, which I have as an amendment, but I don't have the wording of it. Then I go to the last one, which was Rebecca and David, to add a half a librarian at the middle school and maintain all integrators at an EdTech 2 position uh, and you talked about balancing that and that it would be $24,862 out of the contingency. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't know, David or Mary, if you can tell me what the middle one was. Well, I, what I was trying to do was to approve our budget um, as set forth in the, the total amount, but with the specific changes set forth in the midpoint budget um, as modified in dated 4 5 2010. Good. Yep. Thank you very much. Okay. So that's the motion. Any further discussion? I think there was one by you to make a change. So he already, he, oh, already, he already went through that. Okay. All those in favor? Three, Seven. Five, six, seven. All those in the plus. Thank you, everybody. Okay. And Rebecca, even though it's your last year, you did a great job getting this tough budget together. Thank you. Beautiful job. <laughs> yeah. I think okay. we're losing our audience. Oh, well, we God. still have business people. Come <laughs> <laughs> back. Well, obviously, you don't care about coaches. I got that message. Jeff. Or your stay. <laughs> okay. We have consideration to approve the following extracurricular position recommendations. Alan. Um, I would like to suggest um, to the school board members that we make a motion um, and then we can ask Alan any questions after that. So does somebody have a motion? Yes. Hey, John. I you... move that we approve the following, the following extracurricular position recommendations as listed in the agenda or do I have to? As, listed, as, as recommended by the superintendent. And recommended by the superintendent. Is there a second? I, I second the motion to uh, approve the extracurricular positions as set forth in 7B of our agenda. Okay. Thank you. All right. Discussion? Questions? Okay. All those in favor? 7-0. Seven. Seven Did you raise your hand? Thank you. Okay. Consideration to approve the job description for school counselors. There are a motion. I... Uh, Go ahead, Linda. She's she first. Mm. I move that we approve the updated job description for school counselor as submitted. Is there a second? Second. Is there any questions or discussion? Mm -hmm. Thank you for doing this work. Mm -hmm. And the human resources and Alan. All those in favor? 7-0. Seven zero. Seven zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, leave request for Carly Main. Is there a motion? For what? 
Is there a motion for the leave request? The leave request. For Carly May. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there a discussion? Questions? All those in favor? Seven. Okay. Committee reports. We will delay reluctantly until May's meeting. Um, I would just urge everybody to keep on working towards our goals because one of my goals is to make sure that everybody keeps on working towards their goals. <laughs> we need to. Well, it all depends on you then, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Public comment on non agenda items? Seeing none. <laughs> Thomas. Okay, school board agenda requests. None. Okay. Um, and announcement of upcoming meetings. Um, they are listed on the website. Uh, we do have a workshop um, on April 27th where we'll be reviewing the teaching and learning guidance report. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Mary seconded. Thank you. All those in favor? Here. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.